I would like to thank all of you co for coming to this event, especially the speakers for uh, acknowledging this invitation to participate in this debate. Um, so this debate is the debut for a debate series called The Till Line, and it's funded by the One World Sussex Fund in order to promote um, understanding of global issues and uh, encourage diversity. I will quickly go into the guidelines for the debate. So um, we've got three presenters, and each of them will be given 15 minutes to present. And at the end, they will be given five minutes each to, uh, for a rebuttal. And uh, questions and answers will be entertained at the end of the program. So if you have any questions, uh, I will I advise you to just keep it at the end of the debate, then you can ask your question. I'm going to go quickly to, intro, to introduce the speakers. The first speaker is um, Dr. John Michel. He is, the, he is from Sussex, and he's a reader in social anthropology. He, his research has been deeply into religion, belief, rituals, economic assessments, culture, and also views. So, uh, those in the School of Global Studies uh, know him uh, best, and uh, he will be speaking about such perspectives on religion. He is an author, or he is currently writing a book called Anthropology of Religion and Ritual. And the second speaker is Dr. Robert Thorvald, and he is somebody who, who the media call a septic or atheist. He is from the National Secular Society and uh, a member of the Brighton and Hope Humanist Society. He is an author of a book called Did Christians Steal, uh, Steal Christmas? And apart from that, he has participated in so many different debates, um, like Why There Is a God with Kate Ward, and also A Case for Theistic Evolution. He has also um, uh, perform a debate to, uh, with uh, Abdullah and Dulisi, which is called Do Morals Require God? So this is not the first time they are meeting. This is just like a second <laughs> round two. <laughs> round two. <laughs> All right. And uh, his position today is humanity does not need religion. Our third speaker is Abdullah and Dulisi. He is an international speaker a thinker and intellectual activist. He has uh, appeared in, uh, on so many TV programs and uh, performed debates with so many different people on atheism, liberalism, secularism, Islamic beliefs, and so on. And apart from that, he has given so many lectures on the purpose of life, science and religion, evolution, etc. So uh, without wasting much time, I uh, invite Dr. John Michel to come over and present his argument. Thank you very much. You give me some time off to yeah. <laughs> do this. Thank you. Thanks very much. Thank you very much. And thanks everyone for coming. It's good to see the lecture theatre so full. Um, some of you who come to my religion and ri ritual lectures on a Wednesday will know that it's not quite as full for that. <laughs> I wonder why that is. Anyway, thanks very much and thank you very much for the invitation to, uh, to, to come along. Um, in a sense, the question posed before the House is one of kind of prescription. Would we be better off? And as a social scientist, I'm not very used to dealing with those kind of prescriptive types of issues, to deciding which way or another way society should go. I'm more interested in description and accounting for and thinking about the way things actually are rather than the way that they should be. Um, but from the way that things are, so far, that, far as I can see, the question, would we be better off without religion, is a bit of a non-starter, perhaps? Um, and for kind of two kind of reasons I'm going to go into. I've really got three points, one of which is about uh, the extent to which a notion of religion, religious practices, religious ideas are embedded very deeply within human existence and historically have been so and will, I think, continue to be so. 
The second thinks about an anthropology of religion and what an anthropology of religion can do. I'm an anthropologist. Um, and the third is thinking about broader trends within uh, religion and observations that social scientists have made over the past, say, 30, 20, 30 years about the, the, the trajectories of religion within contemporary society. Okay. So the idea that even hypothetically we can get rid of religion and be without it doesn't seem plausible to me. Religion, or perhaps more specifically religious thought and practice, in some way, shape, in some way, shape or form, are an essential property of humanity. Cognitive and evolutionary anthropologists describe religion as part of the hu of, a, of a kind of inherent human capacity, developed actually earlier than the previous <laughs> speaker suggested, uh, at some stage during the upper, upper Paleolithic or Old Stone Age, so thinking 50,000 to 10,000 kind of years ago, um, as part of the, kind of the major revolutions in Homo sapiens that were happening at that time. Revolutions during which we see the emergence of modern types of behaviours, um, particularly the emergence of agriculture, and particularly the cognitive move which happens within the thought processes of Homo sapiens, uh, which became the capacity to think of things or to imagine things, perhaps. And by imagine, I don't mean imagine imagination in the sense of things that aren't necessarily really real, but to think of things as being bigger than them, and to think of things which transcend them, lie outside them, to think of things outside and surrounding them, them. things which within which people exist and in relation to which people exist. So there's a kind of cognitive capacity for thinking of things bigger, which is inherent to religion and which is religion. Such a mode of thinking isn't just necessary for religious thought, but actually for social life more generally, which is also premised on our conceptualising, or perhaps, again, more accurately imagining, things that are bigger, family, community, society, culture, state, nation, religion, all of these things are things which humans have the capacity to think. And that's firmly embedded with, in who we are, and it will continue to be so. The anthropological account of religion tends to have a very much broader understanding of religion than perhaps other disciplines, and perhaps also than the other two speakers today, I'm not sure. Um, or perhaps bigger than the, the, the more common sense. And the reason for that is the history of anthropology and its kind of role in understanding traditional and indigenous societies outside the centres of Abrahamic religious tradition, in which religion often takes the form of ancestor cults, forms of animism, totemism, or practices associated with tapping into hidden cosmic forces practices that became or become labelled as forms of sorcery or forms of witchcraft. All of these things for anthropologists count as religion because they count as this, this type of imagination of something bigger than you as a human. In each case, anthropologists look at these kinds of practices and also at practices associated with the more organised or world religious phenomena, forms of Christianity, Islam, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism and so on. Anthropologists look at these practices as much as possible from the perspective of the people who themselves practice them. And in a recent piece, which I'll refer back to in a minute, the anthropologist Scott Attram reminded us that anthropology's first rule is always to understand, to empathise with those who we seek to understand. Not necessarily to <laughs> sympathise, and there are reasons why we might not want to sympathise with some particular aspects of religious thought or religious practice, but certainly to understand and to empathise in order to understand, to put ourselves in the feet and in the, in the position of people who are thinking, behaving, practising in certain kinds of ways. Now, the study of religions over the past 30 years has seen a profound shift. Um, through the mid-20th century, the intellectual orthodoxy saw religion gradually diminishing in its significance. There was a, the presumption and the assumption of a process of secularisation of society, that society would become progressively more secular, move away from religion. This is linked to the idea of the project of modernity, which predicted 
as did Max Weber, um, a kind of central thinker in this respect. A fundamental secularization of the world, but a dis disenchantment of the world, what he describes as a disenchantment of the world. A move towards science and reason becoming the dominant modes of thought, and a move away from anything which wasn't anchored in scientific understandings of nature. From the 1990s onwards, though, scholars have identified a counter-trend to this process, and we've now witnessed a substantive desecularization of society, a re-enchantment of the world in some contexts, to the extent that some scholars now talk of a post-secular society. Now, one of the most interesting things about this move, about this trend, is that actually many of the religious forms that have emerged seem to themselves stem from and thrive within the context of contemporary global modernity. Even if in some contexts they appear to completely reject contemporary uh, modernity. I'll give you th three, three examples. The first one is forms of evangelical Christianity, and particularly Pentecostalism in the global south, which appears to provide particular solutions to the ex existential problems of newly proletarianized and alienated, alienated workers. In fact, it seems to be tied up specifically with the predicaments of global capital and people who are at the bottom end of global capital. In contexts of extreme poverty and inequality, they're offered an egalitarian hope of salvation and prosperity, certainly in the next world, but also often in this world as well. And you see the rise of prosperity gospel and so on in the global south. So that's the first, the first kind of example of a but your big rise in religiosity, which is, can be directly linked to modernity rather than opposing it. The second process is perhaps closer to home, and this is in forms of new or perhaps new age types of spiritualism, which emerge in the contemporary West, certainly emerge big time in places like Brighton. These range from forms of... Uh, contemporary neo-paganism, Wicca witchcraft, goddess spiritualism, and so on, which offer a high, highly individualised and consumerist bourgeoisie the opportunity to consume and create their own kind of religious spiritualism or its spirituality from within the global spiritual marketplace. So again, it seems particularly suited to a particular class of person oriented around a particular type of position within contemporary modernity. The third example is not so obviously about modernity, and it's also about uh, the example about, about which I probably know the least. Um, my research principally deals with forms of Christianity, particularly popular Catholicism in southern Europe. Um, but the third example is comes from Islam, and refers to forms of resurgent confident, sometimes even militant forms of, of, of Islam. Now Islam obviously, like Christianity or any other kinds of religious tradition, is plural. Tal al-Assad, the um, well-known famous anthropologist of uh, Islam, describes Islam as a, a discursive tradition. In other words, a kind of series of conversations held locally and globally about how best to live our lives for the pursuit of maximum spiritual spirituality, maximum spiritual benefit, to maximise the potential for salvation. So it's a conversation about how best we should do that. Like many religious conversations, though, they frequently revolve around questions of origins, fundamentals, or foundational principles. And this has led some commentators, and notoriously scholars such as Samuel Huntingdon, to point towards the inherent compatib incompatibility between Islam and the modern world. But this is misleading, even and perhaps especially at its most extreme. Now, I'm going to go back to Scott Atran, who's been doing some interesting work looking ethnographically, anthropologically, as the groups that has come to be known as ISIS, or whatever we, we, we kind of call it. Um, trying to put himself, trying to do this anthropological job of placing himself in the position, empathising with people who are involved in, the, in, in that particular, particular group. 
And he concludes that we, one, do those people a disservice, but also misunderstand what's going on if we simply condemn it as a form of backwards kind of barbarism, medievalism. And I'll quote from him, violent extremism, he says, represents not the resurgence of traditional cultures, but actually refers to their collapse. As young people unmoored from millennial traditions, from their religious traditions, flail about in search of social identity that gives personal significance and glory. This is the dark side of globalization, he says, or the dark side of modernity. They radicalize to find a firm identity in a flattened world. Now, what I'm trying to say is that where there was in the past presumed to be a fundamental incompatibility between religion and modernity, this now seems to be not the case. Religious forms are modern forms, and we misunderstand them if we see them as being anything other than modern forms. Even perhaps in the most kind of banal sense that they exist in the modern world, in the contemporary. Now to this extent, and to the extent that religious thought appears to be in some senses central to our very experience of the world, we, the, the world that we live in and the world that we create, the very kind of proposition that we can do away with religion seems to me to be slightly problematic. Religion kind of is, and it's our task, or certainly my task, to try and understand it. That's it. Right on time. Yeah, that's okay. okay. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Just finished 13 minutes exactly. Okay, <laughs> thanks very much, uh, Dr. John Michel. Um, may I invite uh, Dr. Robert Stovall to present his argument? Thank you. Thanks. Uh, where's the controller for that? Oh, just the mouse. Right. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Thanks very much for uh, inviting me to talk here today. Um, uh, a bit about my... Oops. Ooh, I don't know what that is. Oh, well. Yeah, it's going up. Right, it's okay now. Yeah. Big file, sorry. Mm -hmm. Yeah, okay. Uh, my own background, uh, if you're wondering what, the, uh, uh, what I'm a doctor of, uh, I studied, well, uh, biology at university uh, and ended up studying earthworm, bur earthworm burrowing behaviour, so nothing remotely to do with religion. But um, I got interested in religion through having kind of arguments with Jehovah's Witnesses about life, the universe and everything, and evolution. So that's the kind of link with the biological background, which is what my, uh, uh, what my uh, doctorate is in. Uh, so I'm going to talk a bit about the um, positive roles that religion is said to play and what some of the alternatives are and also uh, where's the evidence that religion is actually needed. So one commonly uh, held belief is that we need religion in order to know uh, what's good. But uh, a big problem here is that there are uh, great differences within, um, between and even within religious traditions uh, as to what the right thing to do is. Now you could argue, well, it, in one sense it doesn't really matter what the right thing to do is as long as people just have a shared idea of what's right. Uh, well, you don't need religion for that. And if, if religion's very diversive, uh, which I think it is, uh, humanity, I think, would be better off Without it, how do we distinguish um, a valid uh, religion, religious experience, if there is one, from a delusion? Um, we also need to look at what makes an action right, if religion is a sense of, uh, gives us a sense of morality. Um, now, Plato asked that question, and he considered the answer that uh, something's right because God said so. But he encountered a problem with that. Uh, let's assume that something, let's assume that murder is wrong because God said so and stealing a pencil is wrong because God said so. If that's all there is to morality, that implies that murder and stealing a pencil are both wrong for exactly the same reason. 
which in turn implies that one is no worse than the other. And I think most people have an intuitive sense that murder is worse than stealing a pencil, although there is a line in the Bible that says if you break even the smallest law, you're guilty of breaking all of them. But uh, I think most people would go uh, along with the idea that murder is worse than, um, than stealing a pencil, which, which kind of implies there must be more to morality than God said so. Um, so there's uh, another worry that uh, religious people have, that um, without religion we can't have uh, what, uh, what we might call gold standards. And, and the last time we uh, met in a, in a debate, because I've uh, debated with you before, um, you said, well, yeah, atheists can be moral, but they, the problem is they don't know where the morality comes from. They don't have any gold standards. Their standard is like a paper money, which only has value because people agree on it. It doesn't have any absolute standard, any gold standard. And I said, yes, but even gold doesn't have an absolute standard. If you're on a desert island, then uh, starving to death and there's a ship up in the distance, but uh, you're about to run out of food. Um, sandwich, a sandwich, which normally has very little value, will be worth far more to you than a bar of gold. So even gold doesn't have, although we use it to mean some absolute standard, even gold doesn't have value in an absolute sense. It's valuable only to the extent that people do value it. Its value is human given. Uh, another question, the, the golden rule, the idea we should treat people as we'd like to be treated. Um, well, that's... Uh, that's common in lots of religions. It's a very important uh, rule, a very simple one, and I, I think quite a promising basis on which to build morality, but it doesn't require a belief in God. In fact, it refers us away from divine standards and back to human ones. So I don't think we need religion in order to have uh, the golden rule, which is, I think, a good aspect of many religions. Uh, another th problem is that the perceived goodness of a behaviour or teaching is often advanced by religious people as a reason for why we should accept it. People say, oh, well, we should follow Jesus because he was such a great teacher. Um, now, the problem with this line of thinking is that it acknowledges that human beings already have the capacity to recognise greatness when they see it, um, that, that human standards are sufficient for making judgments. If uh, God came along and placed his standards in front of me and said, what do you think of them? I'd have to use my standards in order to judge them. We can't get away from using human standards. And if you believe that uh, free will is important, as, as religious people say, that, imp uh, that implies that uh, human ability to make judgments is important. And you can't get away from it. There's no use in trying. Social animals, uh, bees, ants, wolves can live cooperatively with no evidence for the uh, divine aid. So why assume humans need it? Morality is a useful adaptation to group life, and evolution in general terms uh, favours useful adaptations. Why can't we uh, suppose that evolution gave us the ability to live together? Why do we need uh, religious rules? Um, evidence for this comes from the fact that some animals have a sense of fairness. I'll play you a short video now. Uh, this is primatologist Franz de Waal. So a final experiment that I want to mention to you is our fairness study. Uh, and so this, the, the, this became a very famous study, and there's now many more, because after we did this about 10 years ago, uh, it became uh, very well known. And we did that originally with Capuchin monkeys, and I'm going to show you the first experiment that we did. It has now been done with dogs, and with birds, and with chimpanzees. Uh, with, but with Sarah Brosnan, we started out with capuchin monkeys. So what we did is we put two capuchin monkeys side by side. Again, these animals, they live in a group. They know each other. We take them out of the group, put them in a test chamber. And there's a very simple task that they need to do. And if you give both of them cucumber for the task, the two monkeys side by side, they're perfectly willing to do this 25 times in a row. So cucumber, even though it's really only water in my opinion, but cucumber is perfectly fine for them. Now, if you give the part the grapes, the, the, the food preferences of my capuchin monkeys correspond exactly with the prices in the supermarket. And so if you give them grapes, it's a far better food, uh, then you create inequity between them. So that's the experiment we did. Recently, we videotaped it with new monkeys who had never done the task, and they're thinking that maybe they would have a stronger reaction, and that turned out to be right. The one on the left is a monkey who gets cucumber. The one on the right is the one who gets grapes. 
The one who gets cucumber, note that the first piece of cucumber is perfectly fine. The first piece she eats. Uh, then she sees the other one getting grape, and you will see what happens. So she gives a rock to us, that's the task. And we give her a piece of cucumber, and she eats it. The other one needs to give a rock to us. And that's what she does. And she gets a grape. And she eats it. The other one sees that. She gives a rock to us now, gets again cucumber. <laughs> she tests the rock now against the wall. She needs to give it to her. And uh, she gets to cover again. <laughs> So this is basically the Wall Street protest that you see here. <laughs> okay. Um Another problem, um, religious in, religion will encourage us to be good. Well, but if you're motivated by the reward of, uh, the, the, the promise of future reward or, or the, the threat of punishment or deterred by the threat of punishment, is that really moral? Uh, motivators don't have to be religious. You know, we all like to be surrounded by other people who are happy. Um, there's pleasure to be gained by having a clear conscience. These are non-religious, perfectly human uh, reasons for wanting to be happy ourselves and to want uh, make other people happy. Um, another idea, well, without God, human life has no value. What's the point in it all? Well, well, praise, praising an afterlife can devalue this one. Look at the revolting ideas that uh, the Bible uh, tries to sort of promote. We've all heard the story of... Uh, I, uh, of um, Abraham and his son Isaac, who he's, he's willing to, the fact that he's willing to kill his own son because he thinks God's telling him to, um, it conveys the message, nothing is more important than God. This is a very dangerous message. Um, we ought to be saying, if you think you're going to hear God telling you to chop your son's head off, you've got a problem. Um, another sort of philosophical problem, the value of a thing relates to how easy it is to replace that thing. Why does anything have any value to God? He's, he can do whatever he wants. For, for me, the value of human life comes in the fact that it's so hard to put it back together again if it goes wrong. It comes in the limitations of human beings. Um, and the value in human life, I think, is summed up and also applies to animals. Every sentient being values his or it, her or its life, even if no one else does. That is what is meant by saying that the lives of all have inherent value. So I don't think we need religion uh, for these reasons. Um, religion and education. Uh, the Wolf Commission has just published a report called Living with Difference, very important thing to be able to do. Um, and they make the point that um, dividing people up by, by religion in a multi-faith society is dangerous. It, uh, it's socially divisive. It uh, leads to greater misunderstanding. People don't mix from a young age. It's kind of educational apartheid. And um, it's uh, something that the National Secular Society has been arguing against this segregation uh, for hundreds of years. What might work for small societies is no, uh, has no place, I think, in uh, trying to build a, co a cohesive country today. Uh, look at all the terrible things done by modern atheist regimes. This one usually comes up. Well, Pol Pot was a Theravada Buddhist. Adolf Hitler, he appealed to religion... Uh, and built on anti-Semitic uh, anti ideas within Christianity in order to gain power. Uh, atheists can certainly be nasty, yes, I'm not disputing that, but it's some other philosophy that does it. Atheism is simply the absence of belief in God. Don't blame atheism for, for that. Um, another problem is that Christianity tells us God establishes authorities and that we should not rebel against them. Or maybe if someone had rebelled against Hitler a bit quicker... Um, what he'd wanted wouldn't have come about or wouldn't have come as close to com coming about as it did um, and the problem is repressive regimes share many features of fundamentalist religions they are often dogmatic intolerant, impervious to change the problem with these uh, repressive regimes is that they are too much like religion uh, so we, this, this is, we should be arguing against religion I think um, and uh, this sums up uh, one problem 
Uh, tend, Christians, uh, religious people, tend to count the hits and ignore the misses. But in fact, many features of um, religion uh, legitimise some of the worst features of humanity, really. Um, uh, there's, there's intolerance in the idea of hell, the idea you can, it's, it's right to, to make your enemy suffer forever. Um, we almost finished? Yeah. Okay, uh, so I'll, I'll sum up here um, uh, a quote. The worldview that guides the moral and spiritual values of an educated person today is the worldview given to us by science. But the scientific facts do not by themselves dictate values. They certainly hem in the possibilities. By stripping ecclesial, ecclesiastical authority of its credibility on factual matters, they cast out on its claims to certitude in matters of morality. The scientific refutation of the theory of vengeful gods and occult forces undermines practices such as human sacrifice, witch hunts, faith healing, trial by ordeal, and the persecution of heretics. The facts of science, by exposing the absence of purpose in the laws governing the universe, force us to take responsibility for the welfare of ourselves, for our species, and our planet. For the same reasons, they undercut any moral or political uh, system based on mystical forces, quests, destinies, dialectics, struggles, or messianic ages. And in combination with a few unexceptionable convictions that all of us value our own welfare and that we are social beings who impinge on each other and can negotiate codes of conduct, the scientific facts militate towards a defensible morality, namely adhering to principles that maximise the flourishing of humans and other sentient beings. This humanism, which is inextricable from a scientific understanding of the world, is becoming the de facto morality of modern democracies, international organisations and liberalising religions, and its unfulfilled promises define the moral imperatives we face to get today, from uh, Stephen Pinker. Um, an example of the problem here that religion leads to, you start with the idea that we should be loving to our neighbour, end up with the idea that uh, actually it's all right to go around killing innocent children, and the real victims in this are the, are the uh, soldiers that carry it out. If you can legitimise this, you can legitimise anything. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Robert Stovold, for a wonderful presentation. Um, without wasting time, I will invite uh, Abdullah Andulisi to come and present his argument. Thank you. Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. In the name of God, most gracious, most merciful, thank you uh, to, for attending. I would like to thank also the uh, Society, the Nigerian Student Society of the University of Sussex for inviting me and my esteemed colleague, um, Dr. Robert Stovold, uh, for an interesting discussion, an interesting debate. A lot of questions have been uh, brought up, and I think they do deserve some interesting answers. Now, I think what the current media kind of portray in this day and age and what has now become almost popularized, at least in um, uh, Western contexts, is that religion hasn't given anything positive and has only been detrimental and that human progress and rights and justice have been despite religion and not because of religion. Um, the common myths you'll hear is that obviously terrorism is due to so-called religious groups that there's a clash between religion and uh, science, that religion calls the dark ages in Europe, that religious countries are backward, and that current scientists' populations are, are basically atheist or atheistic, uh, which uh, makes them good in science. All these are actually false myths. Now, as students, you probably are no strangers to coming into a, a university lecture class and hearing your lecturer tell you a shockingly true fact that goes against everything you thought was true about that particular subject matter prior to that lecture. And that's because what is popularly known is very different from what actually is the truth in many cases, which is why we have academics, which we, why we have scholars, because their job is to not just rely on um, front page tabloid uh, headlines, but to actually look at the facts for what they are. So let's go into that. 
The, a lot of uh, countries that are portrayed to be backward in uh, the modern world, which some of them which identify to be religious, are, for the most part, post-colonial uh, constructs. Um, even in countries where there's, there's religious tensions, these countries' political systems have actually been formed by British secular uh, values of politics. Take Nigeria, for example, which I thought would be relevant to this society that invited me. So Nigeria, prior to the British uh, coming in and bringing civilization, uh, we saw the uh, Sokoto Caliphate and Borneo Sultanates, which were in the north, where uh, is predominantly Muslim. We see that in history, there has been no issues or problems or killings or murders or uh, political strife between Muslim and Christian communities for centuries prior to the British coming and using uh, Christianity as uh, almost like an underlay for um, British, uh, the British mission there to uh, imbibe British, to, uh, prescribe, sorry, to uh, prescribe British values upon the natives. So much so that it has caused, after colonization, colonization and the creation of the artificial uh, nation state in Nigeria by the British, has caused these kind of ethnic problems. Same with India. Um, there is actually, if you look at the history between Hindus and Muslims, there was actually a large degree of uh, tolerance. There was no uh, you know, systematic destruction of Hindu temples as is portrayed by modern uh, nationalistic groups in India at the moment. Academic after academic research has shown that um, Hindus and Muslims have lived peacefully together for centuries. That changed when, well, you guess it, Britain, Britain came and imposed a divide and rule strategy and then created a nation state. And I, the problem with nationalism is that when you have uh, societies which are not homogenous, who gets to decide the national character of that, of that country? That leads to problems. That leads to infighting as different groups try to struggle to, to define the national uh, character of that society. We're really seeing this, this problem in Europe with immigration and, and uh, what it means now to be British now. And obviously with um, the government now discussing what it means to be British and imposing their, its own values onto the people, which most people um, obviously have taken issue with. So these are the issues we, which we see in secular politics. Um, just to give an example, so the, and one other example, so take Uganda. Prior to British colonialism, Uganda never had a concept of the homosexual, nor did they have any opposition in their culture, per se, between uh, same-gender uh, intercourse or marriage in Ugandan culture. They actually never had an opposition to it, and they never even had a name for it. It was just a phenomenon. When the British came with their Victorian values, they brought them a label, and they told them to be intolerant to that label. And then that's what led to um, the recent laws um, prohibiting homosexuality in Uganda. It was due to... The, the label homosexuality, by the way, was invented in uh, Europe, and then it was exported to the world. And after that label was exported to the world, people became intolerant to whoever was identified with that label. And suddenly with that label, now you have to have a certain culture, so it's almost like a, a certain subgroup, or a, a certain different species, or a different um, uh, identity group, when your sexual preference really isn't the cause of a culture, or a p or political group, or identity. We all have different preferences for a thousand different things. Some like Marmite, some don't like Marmite. You're not going to be defined as Marmite community with Marmite rights and Marmite culture. Right? So p the labelling of people caused discrimination in the first place, which we got from um, the uh, so-called secular civilization. Dark Ages wasn't caused by religion. It was caused by, any historian, history student will tell you, the collapse of the Roman civilization or the, Roman, uh, the Western Roman Empire. The Eastern Roman Empire didn't collapse and didn't have a Dark Ages. And of course, the Roman Empire were Christian, predominantly Christian for at least one to two hundred years before, before they collapsed, producing great philosophers like St. Augustine, for example, who deemed to be the last classical philosopher of uh, well, the classical times. So that's not um, correct. Um, science, for the most of its history, has been patroned and dominated by theists, or Christians, Muslims, Hindus, uh, Chinese, uh, Buddhists, uh, you name it. The first universities in Europe were patroned by which organization? Anyone know? The Roman Catholic Church. The first... You know, uh, Europe had 600 years of the Renaissance without secular government or liberal government. That only came in around the uh, 19th centuries. So for 600 years, Europe got from being you know, medieval peasants to wearing the, those, the tri-corner cap and that uh, you know, Baroque uh, fashions with no secular liberal government, no secular liberal values. It was dominated by the Catholic Church and then by Protestants in certain areas. So we, we didn't see this. Um, 
more interesting facts. In the 16th century, the Pope issued a papal bull prohibiting the enslavement of natives around the world due to uh, European colonization. He was overruled by the King of Spain, who be the secular powers, who didn't see it as profitable to do, to do so. So the, the, the Pope was overruled by um, secular powers. And there was a papal bull issued in the 16th century prohibiting it. It was called the um, Sublimus Deus was the bull, if you want to investigate it for yourself. So there's a lot of issues here. Um, obviously, the Islamic civilization was responsible for a great confluence of knowledge and an affluence of it and prosperity and pluralism and multiculturalism. The oldest churches in the Muslim world are in the Muslim world. And the Muslim world pioneered, you could say, a type of multiculturalism that the West doesn't have today, whereby different religious communities or groups could live under their own law systems. Whereas here, in England, just talk about Muslims having arbitration, Sharia arbitration courts, everyone goes crazy and loses their mind. Whereas in the Muslim world, for centuries, Jews had Jewish courts, Christians had Christian courts. And yes, there were atheists too. We know this because there were great, wonderful public debates between Islamic scholars and atheists in Baghdad. For some reason, a lot of atheists in Baghdad. Islamic Baghdad. Right? So there was no massacres or killings of infidels or pagans or disbelievers like this. It's all false. And neither is it in our scriptures. As for the issue of terrorism, um, terrorism is a modern phenomenon. And if you look at the Al Jazeera interviews of, with people like Osama bin Laden, uh, when they asked him, said, Osama, why are you advocating to uh, kill women and children and civilians in the West um, in derogation of Islamic laws, which are, prohibit you from killing non-combatants? Osama bin Laden's response was, well, the law's not set in stone. That's his response. He's a modernist. Modern. He's, re he's, a, he's not a, a, a traditional Islamic thinker. And the, and the only verse of Quran he ever uses to justify terrorism is, fight them like they fight you. Of course, if he finished that verse, it says, but do not commit transgression or, or exceed the limits. <laughs> right? he, doesn't, he doesn't finish that verse of the Quran. But as his argument is, well, the West bombs us. They don't care about our civilians. In fact, his uh, object of emulation is Western history. If you, Osama Bin Laden talks about Nagasaki, talks about Hiroshima, talks about World War II, talks about, well, England was okay to bomb German civilians to, to, to uh, protect itself from tyranny, why can't we? That's his imitation, not from Islamic scriptures, not from religion, which, which I condemn. I think the law is set in stone because I, 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 well, I'm a fundamentalist <laughs> and he isn't in this. So we see that. We see that you can't compare religion and atheism because atheism is just a, a rejection of an idea. It says we don't believe in a negation of the, the belief of God. The comparison of atheism is really to theism. Theism and atheism are the same. But the ideologies that you build on top of those things cause the differences, cause, you know, inform your direction. So an atheist could become a communist, could become a social Darwinist, could become a secular liberal, uh, could become a fascist. A theist... Uh, could become a whole number of things, of course. Um, it could be b belief in Islamic politically, belief in a, a politically of, of traditional Christian values. So it's these, uh, you can't compare religion to atheism. You can compare theism to atheism. But the ideologies that you build on top of these uh, basic principles are the only things you, you can compare to each other. So religion can be only compared to, let's say, a political secular ideology or a uh, non-religious ideology. Now... I'd also like to point out that um, secular revolutions have been very bloody and have killed many people, including scientists. So the, the great French scientist Lavoisier was killed by the uh, French revolutionaries, deemed to be one of those aristocrats. They killed him and they didn't care about his contribution to science or his, his, uh, the benefit he has to knowledge. Um, p scientific progress has been impinged by copyright. Uh, disputes and by certainly American companies who don't like other people around the world making cheaper versions of their drugs or even research can be hampered by the claims of copyright. Of course, depending on your moral system, and, the, and some of these things can be legitimate, such as because animal rights would uh, obviously protest against animal testing for the, in, in, the, in the pursuit of science. Obviously, you can't do human testing on certain things which involve humans having to be killed. Um, but that being said, of course, um, America launched Operation Paperclip, I believe, after World War II, to rescue all the Nazi scientists, scientists that had experimented on human beings, and to use their research because it was beneficial for science. 
So uh, we see that there are certain issues uh, you know, that are raised there with, you might say, you know, uh, secular morality and systems. But I also like to point out just um, uh, some uh, statistics before I continue. In 2012, the University of Oregon published a study that two professors who had analyzed 143,197 uh, participants in the World and European Value Surveys discovered, uh, and these surveys between 1881 18, and 2007, they discovered that the results showed that the belief in hell predicted lower crime rates. They also, there was also another study by the University College Berkeley professor Stephen Fish, who studied murder rates in Muslim majority uh, countries and non Muslim majority countries. And he had this conclusion. Predominantly, Muslim countries average 2.4 murders per annum per 100,000 people compared to 7.5 in non-Muslim majority countries. The percentage of the society that is made up of Muslims is an extraordinarily good predictor of the country's murder rate. More authoritarianism in Muslim countries does not account for the difference. I have found that controlling for political regime in statistical analysis does not change the findings. More Muslims equals less homicide. Now, I'm not saying that um, uh, Islam per se is superior to other religions and that was what causes less murder rate. I'm merely showing how it correlates to another study which shows that there are certain beliefs in a metaphysical afterlife which act to impinge the, ro the, the desires of committing murder if people believe there is no um, accountability. Now, that being said, it doesn't mean that someone who lacks religion is going to be immoral per se. People adopt the society's values and cultures around them and those societies, cultures and values were bequeathed them from centuries of, in, this, in the West anyway, Christian, Christianity, Christian morality, which is why, for example, incest is still illegal in this country, despite the fact that you could argue from a secular perspective that if, if uh, the two participants use um, protection, that that wouldn't cause any, uh, any issues. So why, why not allow incest? Why not allow incest between two gay brothers, for example? But that is prohibited because why? Because you got it from uh, Christian values that uh, prohibited that. That might change, though, so... Um, well, that depends um, what about secular morality the idea that well look if we believe in human rights then surely this in of itself does not require religion but the problem is who came up with human rights what defines human rights what human rights all these things are disputed amongst human beings and human, the authority of human beings towards other human beings isn't worth uh, the papers written on depending on um, oh it's, it's dark now <laughs> dark foreboding part of this discussion. So um, human rights basically is no guarantee of, of anything because who defines it, what defines it, how do you interpret it, and what authority does it have in the first place? There are uh, secular liberal philosophers like John Rawls and Michael Walzer who argued, and I, I'll, I'll quote this, that there is an exemption for, for, from, killing, from the prohibition of killing uh, innocent civilians if it's necessary for the survival of your country or for the pursuit of uh, polit political liberal values, for example. And he argued that um, political liberalism allows this supreme emergency exemption from this prohibition. That in certain extreme emergencies, and one example was cited was World War II against the Nazis, you can bomb and kill civilians, you can target civilians if it will bring uh, victory and if it will um, be in, the, in just defense of liberal democratic regimes. John Rawls, he's mainstream secular liberal philosopher. One could argue that maybe Osama bin Laden was reading his book because Osama bin Laden's arguments to justify exemption is identical to uh, secular liberal philosophers. So I put the point, does secularism bring about a, or does uh, secular values or, the, or being devoid of religion bring about any protection from rights, or, uh, really protection from uh, killing or from uh, crimes? I don't think so. And just to kind of finish off on this point, it's really to highlight that um, the idea of is secular values or beliefs are to serve utility. So what if being moral no longer benefits your society? What if not torturing people doesn't benefit your society? Or not bombing people around the world doesn't benefit your society? Then in, most, in almost all cases throughout history, secular politicians have um, overall voted in favour of doing those uh, policies if it bring, makes their own people quote-unquote safer, richer, what, what have you. So I say this, and I'll, I'll say this argument that John Rawls points out. John Rawls says that political liberalism, unlike Catholic doctrine of double effect, allows the exemption from killing civilians, whereas he admits that Catholic doctrine, and also I would posit Islamic doctrine, I would say, does not allow the killing of civilians under any 
circumstances, even if our civilization was, in, was under threat. It's better to die bearing witness to a principle than to survive breaking all your principles. And that's why I see the benefit of religion in today's world. Thank you. Um, okay, uh, thank you very much, Abdullah and Dulisi, for a wonderful speech. Okay, um, now, the, the question was raised, he used the, the term British secular values. Now, Britain isn't constitutionally a secular state now. It's got the Queen as head of its Church of England, head of the Church. Um, it's the only... Uh, only Western democracy, uh, only Western country I can think of, apart from Iran, which allows, as of right, religious people to sit in its legislature. Now, a secular state would allow religious people in, but they wouldn't give, they wouldn't reserve seats specifically for religious people, as we do with the House of Lords, the the Lords spiritual in the House of Lords. Uh, so this country isn't secular. Okay, uh, uh, my, my last slide mentioned kind of de facto secular values. Um, that's only happened quite recently. It's, well, it's happened more uh, in increasing decades. But um, uh, even today, Britain is not uh, technically a secular country. It is, in a fairly practical sense, quite secular. Um, to such an extent that even religious people now, when they argue... Uh, let's say against assisted dying as was done recently they no longer say things like oh we're, we're against assisted dying because God values human life because they know people don't listen to that anymore they, um, they talk instead about the uh, value of human life and not wanting uh, vulnerable old people to be bumped off for their money uh, which are perfectly uh, understandable concerns but you notice they, they've stopped using the language of religion because they know people don't really listen to it anymore or well, most people don't. Um, so, although uh, religion is uh, sorry, Britain is becoming quite secular in a practical sense now. Uh, it's still not sec uh, secular in a technical sense. Um, I think blaming all the the uh, evils on uh, British colonialism. Now, you'll notice in my talk, I mentioned uh, the, the the golden rule, and I mentioned that it's uh, that's lies at the heart of lots of religions. I pointed to some good aspects of religion. I don't see the world in black and white, in a kind of he who is not with me is against me. I can. There are problems I have with, if you have quite uh, um, progressive religious views, your, uh, your views on how to treat people might not be too different from mine. I think some of your reasons for holding those views are wrong, but we can still find common ground there. I don't uh, I don't try and blame everything uh, bad on religion. I acknowledge that some atheists can do terrible things. Um, so uh, I, th I think that th this way that tries to see the best in people, even if they're religious, and I I'm not, is a better way forward for humanity than trying to pin the blame on the other, uh, which, which is what I think my opponent was doing. Uh, you mentioned um, science dominated by theists. Well, until 1828, nobody in this country could, could even hold public office without signing up to the uh, 39 Articles of the Church of England. And uh, when, scientific, uh, when, when the scientific, uh, uh, scientific method was pioneered by, science, by religious people, but, but why go back to old data? Why not look at new data? And most leading scientists today... Uh, there are some religious ones, but uh, they tend to be um, non-religious. They're less likely to be religious than the general population. Why is that? Um, before, before Darwin's theory of evolution, we didn't really have an alternative to divine design. Now, what you're doing by saying, oh, science was started by religious people, you're ignoring all the pro progress that's been made since then. And when, when religion was, was at its most powerful, people were... Uh, they, they prayed to try and get the harvest in. You know, we now have more control over our um, environment. Admittedly, we're not always using it very well. Just look at the overuse of pesticides, problems associated with global warming. Um, but I don't think that bringing religion into it is going to help anything. Uh, the, the, the idea that humans are on our own, that if anyone needs to act, it's going to be us. That there's not going to be a judgment day just around the corner, so we have to take care about the, of the long-term future of this planet. Uh, those are important ideas, and they are threatened by religious ideas that God's up there and God will judge us all. And 
Uh, I think it, it, the idea that we're on our own, as I mentioned in our quote earlier, forces us to take responsibility for the problems that face our planet. Okay, now I'll be able to kind of do some rebuttals, I think, to some points that were made um, earlier on. So, um, just very briefly, so my esteemed colleague mentioned Euphil's dilemma, which is, is something good because God says it, or is it good because it just is good? And that if you believe that something is good because God says it, then um, it are all sins equal? Well, uh, things are illegal because the state says it, but no one says that all crime is equal to each other. So just, no one ever thinks that all crime is equal to, equal to each other just because the state says it. So um, the degree of your crime obviously will vary in both st secular states, for example, vis-a-vis -vis the state, and also in the eyes of God. So it depends on your crime that you do the level of it. Um, the idea of the gold standard, and this is citing our, our previous debate where I mentioned that um, the gold standard is, is worth something, whereas paper money is not really worth anything. In both those situations, we rely on um, a central bank which gives it the ultimate value. And in a way, in, in morality, God would probably be the central bank of, of morality that would ultimately recognize your deeds and give you a recompense, due recompense for it. Without that, then obviously gold and paper money are both worthless things. Uh, the golden rule, treat people as you would be treated. Do we just, can't we just keep that and leave off religion? Well, here's the thing. Not everyone wants to be treated as, um, not everyone wants to be treated as other people would deem that they want to be treated. For example, I saw a debate on BBC Question Time. Uh, one woman from the audience was talking about uh, surveillance and they said, I don't mind if the government can surveil me and check what I'm doing in my private life and my emails. I've got nothing to hide. But we don't want, most of us would probably not want that, even though that woman doesn't mind being surveilled by the state, we don't want to be surveilled by the state. So if she was in government, she'd say, well, I'm going to surveil you because I don't mind being surveilled. Well, then, no, no, I don't want any surveillance full stop because people have a right to privacy, you see? So just because you think something is, uh, is good for you and you treat other people in that way, doesn't mean other people actually agree with you and want to be treated in that manner. So that doesn't work. Biological reasons for morality. Well, you know what? If you want to look at the animal kingdom for morality, then I can also uh, show biological reasons for cannibalism, incest, murder, and infanticide. If you want to go into nature as our source of morality. Um, one could argue, as social Darwinists did argue, including Winston Churchill, that invalids and imbeciles and people who had social def uh, uh, natural defects should be neutered and shouldn't be allowed to uh, have children because that would weaken the gene pool of the nation. As completely... Uh, Darwinistic uh, argument, well, a biological argument for, for that, but a very horrific uh, conclusion. So uh, you can't really argue morality from biology. Biology, uh, the, only, the only morality in the universe is what's possible and impossible, and nothing else. There is no other further morality beyond that. Religion is counterintuitive. It actually tells you to help your enemies. Tell me in nature, is it, is it beneficial to help your enemies? No, it isn't. But in religion, it tells you very counterintuitive things. You need almost religion to tell you to do counterintuitive stuff. You know, help your enemies, uh, do good to those who curse you, and so on. Nature has also natural inequality. Inequality can't be escaped from. So are we going to have constant revolutions and angry monkeys uh, throughout nature? Or, or are we going to... Uh, uh, what religion does is it tries to give us a system to say, look, there are, although we should eliminate inequality as much as possible, but in the end of the day, we can't eliminate all inequality. So what are we going to do? Either we accept it, and it will be redressed in an afterlife, and you know the the, uh, the f solving the equation of inequality in an afterlife where all recompense will be um, based on what we receive in this life, or um, are we just going to rail that we only have this life, and then we will just be envious at each other and, je and jealous of each other, and jealousy and envy, which comes from a hatred of inequality. If someone's got something better than you, you get angry, you get envious, you get jealous of that person. That leads to bad deeds, whereas this, if you know that that other person has something that you don't have, but you know what, they have more responsibility in the eyes of God, that will actually bring you some calm, perhaps. Um, the, he brought the example of Abraham and Isaac. He said, oh, look, God is telling someone to um, kill their, their son. In the Islamic tradition, it's Ishmael. But um, first, in that story, God didn't allow the child to be killed at all. The whole point was it was just a test. It was just Abraham's test of commitment. That's, that's it. He was prevented and stopped from doing so. Whereas one could argue that there are in many um, cultures, in, in the modern day and age, for example, abortion and infanticide, 
and infanticide due to what concern over material circumstances of a, of a poor family is quite common. People think, I can't provide for this child in the future, I have to kill it because I don't want to give it a bad life, for example. Right? And of course, you know, a, a, a very high abortion rate as well um, in many um, secular countries such as in India and um, uh, in China. What Islam did very specifically about this matter is, don't, he, said, he said to people, don't kill your child because God will provide for you. Have faith that God will provide for you and your child. Faith. Having faith in something that was, would be counterintuitive to that person. And just to finish off, the argument that religion is divisive, well, what's your, your response? Enforce unif uniformity upon society? That sounds pretty scary. Um, Nazism... Um, it did promote a type of Christianity. It rejected Orthodox Christianity and promoted its own rebranded secular German nationalist Christianity called Positive Christianity and uh, locked up loads of uh, Catholic priests in, its, in jails and killed them and so on and so forth. So the Catholic priests railed against Nazism and the Nazis just hijacked Christianity and rebranded it as a, a, a Christianity that would serve secular uh, nationalistic German values which the Nazis... Uh, define for themselves. And I'll finish off with, um, with a few other points. Um, the Big Bang Theory was, in a way, from the, from the conclusions of a Belgium scientist, and Einstein didn't like that because it would bring in the idea that the universe had a start point to its existence. He didn't like the idea that the universe wasn't eternal, and Einstein opposed it for a long time until the evidence proved that this Belgian priest um, right, which was, and that his ideas led to be the Big Bang Theory. So atheist, and that was a situation where an atheist didn't want to give up the idea that the universe had a creation, uh, didn't have a creation point, and that allowed, stopped him from accepting um, the proposal by a theist who looked at the scientific uh, evidence for himself and said, well, you know what? The universe did have a start point, Big Bang Theory. Well, he didn't say the Big Bang Theory, but it, it later on was called that, and now that's become the majority accepted position. So just because you're atheist doesn't mean that you're objective or you necessarily will accept what the facts, the scientific facts tell you. And just because you're a theist doesn't mean that your science is going to be wrong. And this was a very recent... Uh, example. So, um, so many other points uh, made which I, I, I wasn't able to address, but I'm not, I'm not pinning the blame just on Britain or on Western civilization. Um, of course, there's many bad things around the world done by people who are mis obviously mistaken and are religious. I'm not rejecting that. I'm merely showing that the religion contributes much more positive than it, it actually does <coughs> negative. Thank you. Thank you. Um, thank you very much, uh, Abdullah and uh, Dr. Stovold. I think, Dr. Stovold, you have one minute if you want to say something again. <laughs> okay. Um, In fairness. Oops, sorry. It's okay. Okay, on, on the subject of uh, uh, might makes, might makes uh, right morality. Uh, just to clarify, I certainly don't believe in that. I believe that our, our sense of morality has uh, evolved, but is not an evolved sense uh, in the same way that it is in other animals. I mean, I think, that, I think that empathy, or most other animals, I think that empathy plays a key role. It's not, not just a sort of genetic rules. It's uh, our own experience of our own lives. Uh, we estimate what other people are going through and use that to imagine, uh, put ourselves in their shoes, value their feelings... Uh, most animals can't do that. Some, I think, like the uh, capuchin monkeys, can do it to a degree. Um, so I, I don't. I, I think there's an important difference between saying our capacity for morality has evolved, and that evolution dictates what's right. I don't believe the latter. I do believe the former. Um, with regards to abortion, the idea of a soul has all kinds of problems. Um, there's recent research that shows that. Um, Lots of outwardly normal embryos are actually formed by the, uh, the composition of several different fertilised eggs. If you believe the uh, fertilised zygotes, if you believe the, spur, the, the soul comes into being at the moment of conception, you must believe they have two souls, and yet they are outwardly normal individuals. How do you work that one out? And what about the split-brain patient who had their corpus callosum, the fibre joining the two halves of their brain, uh, cut in half, one half of his brain believed in God and the other half didn't. What's going to happen to him on Judgment Day? What does that say about souls? Uh, another problem was, it was claimed that the uh, Big Bang raises problems for science. Well, the, the thing is that the Big Bang is about the origin of the universe and time. It leaves no 
time before the Big Bang in order for any creative event to occur. So the question of what happened before the Big Bang is like the question, what, what's north of the North Pole? It doesn't have an answer, but that's not a fallacy. In the, the, the fallacy is you're expecting an answer, you're asking, a sort of, you're asking the wrong question. Um, there's no need to... The idea of causality breaks down when you talk about the Big Bang. You're committing what's called the fallacy of composition. You're assuming that because events in the universe require a cause, the universe itself must require a cause. This is a bit like saying, well, three and five are odd numbers, therefore eight must be an odd number. It doesn't follow at all. The whole could sometimes behave very differently from the parts. And uh, arguments like yours fall down uh, in that regard. Um, okay, uh, this brings us to the end from the speakers. Now we want to open the floor to the audience uh, to kind of interact with the speakers based on what they uh, argued about. And at the same time, uh, we've got, uh, you know, pizza, uh, you know, so even if you don't want to ask any question, <laughs> even if you don't want to ask any question, you should um, just wait for some few minutes, you'll have something to eat. So yeah, if you have question, just raise your hand and uh, I'll pick you up. All right. Yeah. Dr. Robert, can I, I would like to ask you a question. Have you, have you ever read the Bibles or Quran? The whole, the whole Quran and the whole Bibles? I've not read, just some verses. I've, I've read large chunks of the Bible, not absolutely all of it. Uh, I've read very small chunks of the Quran. Um, so, but, but what I've seen and the, and the people I've spoken to, I've seen the way they consistently distort science and they kind of count the hits and ignore the misses. As I say, I got interested in this by talking to the Jehovah's Witnesses. I was, I was rather surprised to find that we were going through the book of Daniel at the time and I, was, I, I began reading up on what biblical scholars said about when the book of Daniel was written. And I was actually quite surprised to find, hang on, they actually agree with me. I'm an, and I'm an atheist. And, and most biblical scholars uh, say that the book of Daniel is written after many of the events it claims to predict. And I was thinking, well, how can... I kind of assumed all religious people just sort of... I, I didn't actually realise even that majority scholarship on this actually agreed with me. And yet still, people carry on believing it. Uh, and this, sort, this was... I just found this quite a frightening idea. Uh, and also the... I just found lots of... But they just kept misrepresenting science. They, for example, they, they claimed that evolution was random. Now, if random means kind of unpredictable. Now, mutations are random, but it contains uh, evolution contains a very uh, predictable uh, element, namely natural selection. If if a, a polar bear is born, that's kind of uh, sticks out like a sore thumb. You can make a very firm prediction about what's going to happen to it. It's not going to be it's going to be seen by prey, it's not going to be a successful hunter, its fate is anything but random. So you see, you get, when you hear uh, people completely twisting, misrepresenting, you know, Darwin said I could never evolve. No, no, I've read the bit in the origin where he's talking about this and he's being misquoted. He says it looks absurd to suppose that an eye evolved, but it isn't because. But they, they, they stop the quote after Darwin says, oh, it's absurd to say an eye could evolve. So when you see religious people lying about stuff you can check, this, this makes you very sceptical of all the claims we can't check, like whether Jesus walked on water or... I think there's a difference between a text and as, as, as a text and a person as... A religious, for example, me, I'm Muslim, mm -hmm. but Quran is Islam, so we are different. I try to, I'm trying every day to be good Muslim, mm. to try apply as uh, as I as much as I can from Quran, but it doesn't mean I I present the whole Quran. Oh yes, well I I, I present Islam. I, I, yes, I, I accept the uh, diversity. I mean, I mentioned earlier Jehovah's Witnesses, and there are many different types of pe interpretation one can draw from the Bible. Some would believe in theistic evolution, some believe in an old earth, some believe in a young earth, some believe in creationism. Uh, but this, this sort of confusing mess is just what we'd expect if there's no God up there to give us a clear picture of what actually happened. If people are struggling to uh, reconcile the, the writings of people thousands of years ago with the findings of modern science, 
So I, I, uh, I acknowledge what you say about the diversity of belief, but this is quite consistent with my view that, um, that religion is made up and largely false. Uh, th this diversity is quite consistent with that, and it's not something... We, we sp you mentioned earlier at the beginning of this lecture the importance of diversity. Now, we need to... If, if it comes to celebrating diversity in terms of, say, skin colour, well, fine, no problem. But in, when it comes to religions, if one of them is right, the other ones must be wrong. We shouldn't celebrate diversity there. We're celebrating falsehood. We're legitimising falsehoods. We should be trying to find the true religion if there is one, or moaning at them all if they're all false. We shouldn't celebrate diversity there. We should celebrate the freedom of a society that allows diversity. I agree with that. But we shouldn't celebrate diversity itself. And this is a big problem I have with people who go on about diversity. So, do you think uh, this... I, 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 just, <coughs> sorry, sorry, please. Sorry, sorry. No, no, no. Sorry, please. You've already asked enough questions. Uh, please, and at the same time, uh, while you're having the pizza, could you also pay attention to the speakers? <laughs> <laughs> And uh, so I'm going to give uh, the other speakers an opportunity to respond to what he said, then we move to the um, other people who want to ask questions. So, I mean, it, this is more of a, an observation, I guess, about some of the problems inherent in talking about the questions of religion and, and the secular, one of which is clearly to do with, you know, generalizing versus particularizing. And there seems to be, you know, a kind of level of generality when we talk about religion being this, being that, but also we need to be aware of the particularities of particular contexts, not just in relation to religion, but actually also in relation to, to the secular, in relation to versions of atheism, and in relation to versions of science as well. That, you know, there's a danger in overgeneralizing on, on kind of both sides and not recognizing the particularity of particular practices, um, which then signals another kind of tension or dis distinction between which the um, gentleman here has raised, which is the uh, distinction between you know, forms of religious practice, everyday life, and you know, forms of theological thought, doctrine, whatever you. And I think that, you know, those two things need to be distinguished when we're thinking about the way in which people are living their lives religiously, or not. Yeah, I'll just be very um, brief. The, um, there, are, there are different theories of gravity. Some theories are wrong. They can't all be right. Some are, you know, there's a, is it a graviton? Is it an indentation of space-time? It doesn't mean gravity doesn't exist. It just means that people have different theories about it. Um, people have different theories about the sun, what it was. Was it a, a disk in the sky? Is it an orb? So on. And, of course, we found that one was correct and others weren't correct. It doesn't mean the sun doesn't exist. Likewise, our re different religions are just, in some ways, you could, you could say, are theories about meaning, purpose, and existence outside, uh, or, or the uh, ultimate cause of, of all things. It doesn't mean that, that this, doesn't, this uh, ultimate cause doesn't exist just because there are different religions saying different things, and you have people interpreting different things. Like, for example, you know, I Einstein didn't want to accept that the universe had a beginning, and so he invented um, something called the universal constants just to try to balance the equations out, but he was proven wrong by the, the teachings which, of, a, of a physicist and Belgian priest, Georges Lemaitre, uh, who, and I think Einstein was, uh, was famously um, said to respond to this to Georges Lemaitre saying, um, your maths is correct, but I hate your conclusion. <laughs> All right? So it doesn't mean anything. Now, as to what came before the universe, um, that, my friends, are pure speculation. Just like, the idea, oh, there's a multiverse before the universe, or there's a multiverse that created the universe. There's as much evidence for the multiverse, posited by some atheist scientists, as there is for Thor and Zeus. And yet, the multiverse theory is called a scientific theory, and yet, and, and um, well, obviously, Thor and Zeus are not scientific theories. So, this is, this is the thing, and I would even posit, even in addition to that, that if you believe in the multiverse, then you actually believe in fairies and unicorns because the multiverse states that there's an infinite amount of possibilities in different, infinite amount of universes with infinite variation, infinite possibilities. In one of these universes, there must be a unicorn, and in one of the universes, must be a fairy. So if you end up believing in the multiverse to escape God and superstitious demons, fairies, and goblins, you end up believing in fairies, unicorns, and goblins, which is the, the irony of that. Um, the other point I would say is. Um, um, in, in terms of uh, sciences, that 
religious people might have theories about what the natural world looks like in any different age. And they might have interpreted their scriptures in light of their own prejudices. It doesn't mean that the scripture is wrong, nor does it mean that religion is causing a, a retrograde on science. It just means that humans are always both a boon and a, a uh, obstacle to their own uh, advancement. In any age, whether you're atheist, whether you're Christian, whether you're Muslim, there were always competing theories. And there were always people from within that same tradition or same belief system that had a one belief one way, one belief the other way. It's a commonly universal phenomenon and it will always, be, it will always persist. And just a modern day example of this, um, the uh, biological study of gender difference is plagued with people who have ideologically motivated uh, uh, drive to deny any difference between, let's say, the, the, the genders. I'm not asserting anything, I'm just saying that there are biologists who are trying to study this matter, trying to study brain differences and so on and so forth, and they're plagued by people who are not necessarily scientists, but ideological, maybe they're feminists, maybe they're men's rights activists, maybe they're whatever, and they're, they're uh, interpolating and trying to uh, act as obstacles to the objective study of gender difference in the human species. And that's just a modern example of how, ide this is secular ideology, is interfering with scientific dis discussion and progress. And that's just a, so all I'm saying is, it's a human problem, but for, the, uh, for centuries of human progress, um, you know, religion has been a motivating factor to understand the will of God best by understanding his creation. And so people would say, to understand his creation, what really exists out there, gets us closer to God. So there were many of these Catholic and Muslim and Hindu scientists studying the natural world objectively because they saw it as a means to get closer to God. So religion has no opposition to science. Science itself is value neutral. And I think to use a great analogy, science will tell you what, what a clock is made out of. But religion tells you what the, the, the purpose of the clock and what those symbols on the clock means. Ironically, in my language, put in Portuguese, relogio means watch. So it's just an interesting uh, anecdote, but that'd be my point to that. Yeah. Sorry, Brian, do you need this? Or yeah. can you speak? You need it. Sorry. Okay. My question is for Dr. Robert. Uh, may I ask you to define what, what you mean by religion in your view? Um, I mean, if you, if you focus on linguistic way, you can find the the definition of religion and the dictionary that means uh, to believe that there is a controlling power to control everything around us, you know? So, I mean, if you agree with that, so we are done, so we don't so, need to argue with that. So what is the question? I disagree the, the definition of religion and his view, you know? Um, okay, it's a, thanks. Uh, it's a good question. I, I suppose I define religion as a, a system of beliefs, um, which, which usually, I, I focused on theistic religion, but not all religion uh, requires a god, so uh, Buddhism, for example, most forms of Buddhism are non-theistic, um, but, but yet still there's the idea that, that human conduct um, has some sort of overriding importance, it's, it's somehow, it's quite sort of human-centered. Um, so it, it emphasizes a special place for humans usually and tell, uh, gives us moral codes, tells us what to do. Um, it's quite difficult to come up with a, a definition actually. Um, it's, yeah, uh, usually it emphasizes some degree of uh, personal, personalization of forces. Um, they, they, the forces are somehow concerned with the, with the uh, actions of people, whereas I think a scientific description tries to be more sort of dispassionate. Um, the law of gravity doesn't care if you hurt yourself. Or, um, uh, I think to answer that question. Um, oh sorry. Thank you. Uh, religion is just a system of belief that gives meaning and purpose to human life. That's it. Technically speaking, and I would, I would certainly um, kind of reference what uh, uh, John Mitchell said, Dr. John Mitchell said earlier on, which is, um, I think anything 
can be defined as a religion in, uh, in one sense. Uh, even religions that don't believe in God, such as humanism. So some could say secular humanism resembles uh, a religion. Uh, some people could say that the, the communism, to an extent, can resemble religion in its, in its totality. Uh, if you want to look at it, if you believe in dialectical materialism and so on and so forth, it resembles a religion because it basically guides that society. And in, in the Arabic uh, language, we have a word called deen, which means a way of life and belief. And it doesn't really make a distinction, this word, between whether your belief or way of life believes in a God or doesn't believe in a God. It's just whatever is the way of life of that people, whatever gives them meaning or whatever gives them purpose, whatever they believe their purpose and meaning to be, and they organize their culture and their way of life around that, that is their deen. And that would, I mean, I don't know if this translates as worldview, perhaps, or, um, and so in English language. So I would say that everyone, to an extent, um, has a religion, unless you are perhaps, I don't know, a nihilist or solipsist, perhaps. But everyone else generally has a religion, even if your religion doesn't believe in a god, per se. Okay, um, we have you and then you and Dr. Rumi, everyone. So, do you need this or who no, speak out? Okay, cool. Um, I'm Muslim, so I'm going to speak to be Muslim. And, and this is not a talk to anyone, uh, either of the I mean, for the speakers. Um, basically, according to history, I'm, I'm trying to ask the question as regards the rights for women in Islam. Um, we know by history that in Islam, uh, the first person that had contact with the prophet when he came out of the cave was Khadija. And he, she was the first person who convinced him to embrace the, uh, the, the, the angel, uh, which she investigated. And so basically, without, without Khadija, the prophet might possibly wouldn't have uh, 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 embraced Ben Islam. So therefore, the first person that became a Muslim is Khadija. So why is, still, why is, it, uh, why is it still difficult? For women to have a place in Islam in terms of like equal to men and, and bringing power into Islam in terms of religion and power. So how does religion, uh, Islam, address the issue of power? Who, who, because if Khadija could have the power, I mean, could use a free will to convince the Prophet to be a Muslim because of the angel that came, then how does a man play a role? I mean, men, not man, uh, play that role to then, so, you know, use the same religion against women. Okay, so a uh, question about women in Islam, um, and I think it's a, it's a very pertinent question considering uh, the degree of misinformation. Um, fundamentally, in, our, in Islamic, in the Quran, in, in our scriptures, uh, it says that uh, men and women are equal in the eyes of God. Fun our, our deeds are equal in the eyes of God, fundamentally. That's what it says in, in a verse. The, the, the deeds of the men and women, they are as the other, is, is the verse, what the verse says. So fundamentally, in the eyes of God, there is no um, higher or lower uh, gender, per se, uh, in the eyes of God. Uh, but because of the um, of sexual dimorphism in the human species, uh, as a biologist you would appreciate, um, we believe that obviously there are, you, you, might, call, you might say, suggested roles to complement uh, both the, uh, the genders in fulfilling a higher purpose. And the higher purpose is not the submission to men or submission to women, but submission to God, which owns all, uh, all mankind. Oh, sorry. <laughs> I thought someone was slurping there or something. That's all right. Anyway. <laughs> Um, so, in the sense, so in Islam, 1,400 years ago, gave women the right to vote. Uh, so, political leadership can only be um, legitimate in Islam if both men and women uh, give allegiance to the, the leader. Then that contract is formed between the people and the leader. So, women were told uh, that they also have to participate in that process. Uh, women are allowed to work. Women were judges, jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence, I might add. They were transmitters of the tradition of the Prophet Muhammad them, which requires good memory and trustworthy memory. So women's memories were trustworthy in Islamic tradition. 40% of um, the Sunni narrations about what the Prophet Muhammad's life comes from Aisha, his wife, Adanha. Um, women, um, uh, women had the right to you know, do professions such as be doctors. And for example, in Egypt, they had that right up until a certain empire came to Egypt and divested women of that role, <laughs> divested women of the role, saying that women don't need to be doctors because men should, there should be sufficient men to do that role. Why? Because they were bringing their Victorian sensibilities to the Egyptians. So you, you, in Egypt, you could be, as a woman, you could be a doctor, a medical doctor, up until you were civilized by this uh, empire. I, I will not name it anymore. Um, and, and the problem is that 
you you really don't un, you don't you can't you can't really overestimate how much impact um, colonialization did. Okay, sure, the Muslim world um, had been going through a period of stagnation, uh, like the Chinese civilization as well, but due to reaching its peak in about 15th, 16th century, which causes um, you could say uh, an equilibrium in its economy, and then uh, and it causes stagnation over a period of time when people reach wealth, a period of a high point of wealth. That's a sociological discussion about um, intellectual degradation over a decadent civilization, but. When the, when the British came, they uh, d n destroyed our, our education system. Um, religious education only continued outside of state sponsorship, so basically only, the, only uh, poor preachers could, would, would continue um, preaching education. The mainstream uh, teaching was done by British education, British imposed um, education system, and including its sensibilities. And, the, and unfortunately, uh, the Muslim world, it's, what you see now is uh, Britain 100 years ago. Right? And right, just example, Lord Cromer, who said he wanted to bring civilization to Egypt to, and to liberate women, um, was against women's right to vote in England at the time, Lord Cromer. He was against universal suffrage for women. Right? And that's what we learned, unfortunately, most of all, that's what we learned from this uh, technologically superior civilization that came to us and remolded our, our, our own institutions so much so that Muslims today are illiterate about our own religion. We're literate about even what our own political system used to look like. So now anyone can claim to be an Islamic state and a, uh, and a caliphate, and Muslims don't know what that even looks like. You see, so you had, a, you had this group, which I'm not going to repeat their name, in Iraq currently and Syria, um, you know, doing horrible things to Yazidis. Yazidis have been, have been under three caliphates for 1,300 years, n not molested, not touched, their temples not destroyed, living and prospering. 1,300 years under a religious government up until the Ottoman Caliphate was destroyed by a certain empire I won't name. Um, and, and then after that, uh, uh, when you had secular Syria and secular Iraq, now you have all these divisions, fightings and killings between religious parties and groups. So as Muslims, we're being blamed for, uh, our religion is being blamed for the activities of what well, ex-Bafists who, who are ex-secularists, secularists um, you know, uh, hijacking our religion and using it for their own purposes. And that whole situation came about because say, other secularists came in and drew borders around our, our regions and divided ourselves into artificial constructs called nationalities and now we're all fighting each other over uh, stupid artificialities which never existed 100 years ago. So truly, I cannot overestimate what colonialism did to the Muslim world and all this, uh, everything I'm, I, I'm talking about Islam, this is not modernized Islam or liberal Islam, this is uh, orthodox fundamentalist Islam. The rights to women, this is fundamentalist Islam. Fundamentalist Islam protects the rights of women. This modernist uh, post-colonial version of the Muslim world is alien to Islam, and that's what we're trying to, uh, to overturn. Does any of you have any comment to that? Well, um, so Jordan, first, yeah, we've said quite a bit. But no, I was just going to say that, yeah, the, I, mean, the, I think the issue of power is very important. So it's probably going back to this question of the definition of religion. That you, you're elaborating a kind of de definition of re religion as culture in a way, which is a kind of particular version, and there's an anthropological tradition of thinking about it, you know, religion is about particular worldviews and so on. Um, the scholar that I pointed to in my short talk, Tal al-Assad, who focuses on the idea of you know, religions or religious traditions as being discursive, is, is precisely in order to capture the, ex the extent to which those discussions have power within them. And are informed by, by power and, and, and historical process. Thanks. Okay, I don't know very much about the um, history of the development of Islam, but if you look at the way uh, Christians today argue about well, everything, really, but uh, it reminds me of that joke um, how many Anglicans does it take to change a light bulb? Two, one to change the light bulb. And the other one to storm out in disgust if the one changing it's a woman. You know, this, uh, the, the, they fragment over everything. Um, and, and there are some verses in the Bible you can quote, oh, there's a deaconess there, a, a woman who had authority in the church, therefore no problem. And there are other verses you, you, uh, you can quote, uh, so the Apostle Paul saying, I do not permit a woman to, te woman to teach or exercise authority in, a, in the church. 
Uh, my suspicion is that there are things you can point to within the Islamic tradition that paint a glowing picture of women, and things you can point to that, picture, that paint a nasty picture. And nice people or people who want you to believe nice things about Islam will point to the nice bits, and nasty people will point to the nasty bits. And it's a flawed system for working out what the right way forward is, because people can find whatever they want in it. And people are less likely to challenge an idea if they think it's got the idea if they think it's got God behind it. We need to have an open discussion and not to be afraid to challenge um, particular views. So that's well, yeah. Thank you. Thank you. No, uh, the other lady goes to Oh, it's okay, it's free. Oh, it's okay. <laughs> um, so basically you said earlier that you haven't read the Quran fully and you haven't actually read the complete Bible, but you also said you found them confusing. I mean, it's no wonder you find it confusing. It'd be like, read a book, half of a book, and then you say you want to draw a conclusion. You obviously are missing some parts of it. Mm -hmm. So I think it's like, I find it really funny that you think it's okay to say that they're you know, misused or confusing or it's just like they're not quite a society where you don't really know the whole aspect of every part of it? Well, what, what I did was I gave, I, I said I didn't know about Islam, I said I suspect it's like, and then I referred it back to something I did know something about, um, by, by analogy with something I did know something about. Uh, I did the best I could under the circumstances. I know recently the Law Society um, people claiming to be Islamic uh, tried to get the Law Society to draw up guidance for uh, the implementation of Sharia law in this country. This was mentioned earlier, you said oh, every time someone says Sharia law people get nervous. Well is it any wonder if you look at the, the, the guidance the uh, Law Society drew up, it, it legitimised the idea that women were only, were, weren't entitled to as much as men. And it, it set out how you could go about achieving this in British law. And uh, the National Secular Society kind of said, well, look, this is, although it's in a technical sense consistent with British law, it does seem to be going against <laughs> most of the values uh, that, that kind of underpin British law. And the Law Society got a bit embarrassed and said, yeah, actually, you're right about that. Um, it, it is technically legal what we've done, but it does seem a bit off. And they withdrew the guidance. So it's no wonder that people get jumpy uh, on the subject of Sharia law. When you see things like this, um, I mean, you, you mentioned earlier that the women being given the vote. Do you think a woman's word is uh, inherently less reliable than a man's or as reliable if you had to generalize? Are there any uh, state, in your understanding of Sharia law, is a woman's word worth, worth less than a man's? Okay. Um, in some, in many cases, her her word is worth more. So it depends the the circumstances. Um, but basically, in in one, I'll just give you one case. So if a, a husband accuses his wife of a particular crime, um, his wife can cancel out her husband's testimony just by making it a counter testimony. So they're of equal weight. Uh, in one case, if it comes to family matters, uh, let's say if she gives a testimony about um, the. the a child and so on about a child, and her testimony might be worth more than a man's. It might require you know multiple male testimony to cancel out hers. So it depends the circumstance. We don't um, we look into the the specific situation and not just make um, a, you know a blanket uniform uh, points. But just to kind of just to show you this equality, right? The idea of equality. Equality in what? Right, and this is the, this is the issue because no one agrees what, in what equality. A communist would believe that equality can only be established in society when everyone gets equal amounts of money or wealth, for example, or capital, should we say. And someone else might say, no, that's not required for equality. Um, so you might believe that equality is that um, in this issue of in that Sharia court um, matter, also guidance by the law society, that uh, they objected to, or was objected to the issue that women get half inheritance or, um, after the death of a, of a, of a, of a family member uh, than a man. But what is not mentioned is that men are under financial obligation to provide for um, the women in their family, of which a woman is not under obligation to provide. So that extra inheritance will actually go for the, to the man to be spent on his wife, his, uh, his, his daughters, his, kids, his sisters, and so on and so forth. Because men are viewed as having the financial obligation that they can't opt out of, and only if their wife gives them permission to waiver that 
then, then, then they are allowed to not have that financial obligation. But women who can work are not um, obliged to look after their male members, uh, their, their, their husband, for example, in Islam. So you see that what Islam, uh, it actually creates an overall equality, but not from a perspective that you might imagine under an individualistic assumption of, human, of the humans, whereas our model of human beings is, fam is family-orientated, not individualistic-orientated. Orient so, uh, and this is a situation which shows how in Western society you, you're seeing the imposition of a particular understanding of certain values onto other people's religious beliefs and, uh, and, and ideas, believing yours to be universal. Whereas if I as a Muslim said in, in that um, uh, anyone that has a non-Islamic belief in living in Islamic lands cannot manifest that way of life because we view it to be unjust, you'd say you're being very intolerant, right? Whereas what we did in the Muslim uh, for 1,300 years consistently was that Christians, Jews, pagans, Hindus, Buddhists had their own courts, their own uh, semi-autonomous zones. They could do, they could live their way of life as they see fit. It, to, to the point, there was even a discussion where you, they encountered Zoroastrians, uh, a, a sect of Zoroastrians who believed in something called self-marriage, which is called where you could do incestuous marriage with one of your family members, which was quite obviously a big affront to a Muslim. We think we, you know, incestuous marriage, we think, is a disgusting concept. Um, no offence to any Zoroastrians of that particular sect in the audience. I don't, don't think they exist. Um, uh, but we were, we were told to tolerate this because that's their religion. We can't interfere. The prime directive. <laughs> right? Whereas in the West, you can't, you know, you, you, you can't uh, turn a page without seeing, oh, look at this, what this minority is doing in our midst. Oh, look what, what they're doing in our midst. And, all this, and so the Islamophobes say Muslims are trying to impose their religion on society. Whereas if you look at what, what, who's really doing the imposition, it's always these shock articles about, oh, look what they're doing in their, in their own community. We have to stop this. Right? And that is intolerance. And that's my, that's my, my point. So, um, and I'll just m mention that the other point you said about um, you can pick and choose. Yes, you can pick and choose stuff in religion. And it's up to people to look at the bigger picture of the, of the text and refute those people who pick and choose. Because there are always going to be humans that do that, very myopic ones. But if I can cite you, like, systematic, consistent, over hundreds of years, um, uh, uh, female scholarship, jurisprudence, Islamic jurisprudence. We don't have a, a clergy, by the way. But Islamic jurisprudence who are women judges who were women, by the thousands, it's not going to be, you know, oh, that was just the exception to the norm, that was the norm. You know, that was the norm for centuries up until the modern age. And then things radically changed when we were civilized by people telling us that, um, oh, women should basically stay at home because that's the Victorian thing to do. And we followed that because they seemed to be superior to us. But with technology, we felt defeated and our, our whole education system was wiped out and replaced, supplanted with uh, one that was extrapolated from, uh, from Europe at the time. So I, I think that, that answers that, that issue. Thank you. Do you have any comment? Yeah. I'd like to just come back to what this talk is about. Would we be better off without religion? And, <clears throat> and, and talk about what is happening in this country and in Europe, where we are. And it's pretty clearly the case that pretty much the majority, probably a significant majority of Europeans, feel that they are better off without religion. Religion, say amongst say the white indigenous Europeans, is dying out at an alarming rate. In this country, less than 10% go to the church on a Sunday. A hundred years ago, it was 90%. Pretty much by the middle of this century, in Europe, it'll only be ethnic minorities who will believe in religion. So we have to understand, which is very different, as John pointed out, to the rest of the world. Religion is dying out in Europe at a very rapid rate. That is a fact. Now, but in Europe, there has long been a struggle against religion and religious morality and religious influence and interference in people's lives. Going, going back, particularly to the Enlightenment, but even before. The Enlightenment was a blistering assault on religion based on science, reason, evidence. And with rising living standards, rising education, most people have realized they do not need religion. They would want it out of their lives. Now, we have an interesting phenomenon in Europe in that we have very many ethnic minorities who are very strongly religious, like our Speaker Abdullah, uh, 
and others in the audience. And this is troubling for many Europeans. I don't think they will be convinced at all with your argument, Sandra. Uh, I think they will react in a very worrying manner. So what I'm trying to say is that we need to understand this reality and those who are very strongly religious must, uh, must understand what is going on in society. Now let's turn to Islam. Islam is a major issue throughout the world, but particularly in Europe and in the West generally. Two opinion polls just this year found that in Britain only 20, both said only 22% thought that Islam was compatible with Western democracy. And that is true with other countries. In 2011, there was a, the most extensive opinion poll by populists on is, Islam and extremism found that 52% of UK citizens thought Muslims create problems for the UK. These are being replicated throughout Europe. To my mind, what is going on is that people feel that there has been a long struggle against the influence of religion, religious ideas, religious privileges, religious practices in society that has largely been won over. And that's why most constitutions are entirely secular, most laws are entirely secular, and they're very worried that these newcomers are imposing very strong religious values that they have taken generations to fight. So I think this reality needs to be mulled over and Mr. Abdullah, most of your answers are bogus. I'm sorry, they are bogus. And this is very serious. You need, you, you need to think more carefully. Thank you. I'll be right without it. Um, okay. This is for, for Abdullah. You said uh, just an example that the Quran said there's absolutely no way of justifying to kill civilians, for example. So this would be a question about religion overall and not just Islam. How do you... Uh, how would you answer or think about the reverse then? If, if your religion is worth killing for, could you see that as being a very dangerous and big problem? And do you see my question? I didn't yeah. flip it over. Yeah. Okay, cool. And then can we take your question again? After he responds, we take you to. Um, I think this question was to the gentleman in the middle. Okay. Um, you said something about the order of the events written in the Bible and in the Quran, um, and suggested that sort of uh, religious writings were uh, made up. Um, I'm curious to know that um, what your thoughts are then on sort of if we take Islam, Islam or the Bible out of it, what your thoughts are on divi divine inspiration and sort of um, things unseen and things that aren't of man. After they respond, then we... Okay, so I think... Yeah. I mean, just, just to make a point about the, um, you know, the, the secularization of European society or, or, or whatever, and, you know, the, 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 the kind of... Um, you know, white majority versus minority type of type of situation. I mean, I think y yes. I mean, there are you know kind of opinion poll censuses and so on, which demonstrate you know a, a, a shift away from certain types of organised religion among what you've described as the you know, the kind of white majority um, community. But there is a str still a strong attachment to the notion of a belief in God, and still a strong attachment to a notion of being spiritual. And actually, that notion of being spiritual appears to be on the rise rather than on the on the demise. So I think that the, the situation that you're painting isn't quite as straightforward as what you, what, as, as, um, as, as the figures seem to suggest, in fact. Um, where that takes you, and I think you know, you're right in, in the extent to which you know, minority religions become, you know, kind of seem to be a source of problem, seem to be because of this tradition of you know, self-described secularism, if you like, um, but I think, in a way, we misunderstand the, the nature of the history of the Enlightenment if we don't recognise that the secularism is itself a content rather than an absence, that it itself is a specific historically locatable set of ideas, discourses, which come from a particular, particular place. 
they're not an, you know, secular, the secular is not an absence of religion, it's a thing in, in and of itself. The atheism is not an absence, straightforward absence of religion, it's a, it is itself a discursive. Humanism is an institutional kind of manifestation of that. Uh, well, you mentioned earlier, well, humanism is certainly a kind of system of beliefs. And um, you spoke earlier about deans, and, and we, we need, don't we need a system of beliefs, a worldview in which to structure our um, understanding of the world? Well, we all do. But the problem comes when you think your worldview is right and cannot be changed. Now, uh, I know exactly what it will take to change my mind evidence. If someone wants, uh, I don't believe that water can be turned into wine, but if anyone here can turn some water into wine, I'm willing to change my mind. The, the problem comes when you end up with beliefs that aren't open to revision in the light of new evidence. And when you have ideas uh, like the importance of faith, which enable people to justify uh, all kinds of beliefs without the evidence to go along with it. Just take a leap of faith. I, I see faith as quite a dangerous thing. It can be useful sometimes, it can cause people to be generous, but it can also be very harmful. And we need to keep our feet on the ground and to minimize a reliance on faith. Uh, and th uh, one problem I have with religion is that it legitimizes a belief in the fantastic and makes, uh, makes dangerous ideas harder to counter. It was said that uh, everything I've said is bogus. Well, I'm refuted. No, Goodbye. <laughs> no. Um, uh, okay. Okay. I, I, I've, obviously, I think we should always make intellectual arguments, but you are obviously perfectly um, within your rights to believe that what everything I said is bogus. But let's let's just see if it is bogus, and let's look at evidence, right? Let's look at what we know from history, what we know from politics, what we know from the situation. Just because. Uh, majority white Europeans are doing something doesn't mean it's right. And I think that's something that we have to, uh, at least I think we can all agree on that, that uh, we don't measure good and bad from what the majority of white Europeans are doing at any point in time. Uh, certainly not um, if, you, if, you, if you go throughout history, you can always point out bad examples. But um, secularism is, and I would concur with um, Dr. Mitchell about this, secularism is a product of a very peculiar set of circumstances that arose in um, Western Europe. Um, about uh, well, a couple hundred years ago. Some could say, and my, this is my theory about this, and no offence to Christians, uh, but uh, Christianity rejecting Mosaic law and then believing that Jesus would come within the lifetime of St. Paul, St. Paul, uh, Roman citizen, you could argue St. Paul's influence on Christianity, changed it from the kind of religion that the Jews would understand to a religion that was maybe more spiritual, only focused. But yet what happened when... Um, when the, the Christian leaders become, well, leads become Christian, then how, what do you rule by? How do you judge this? And so Jesus didn't come as was believed by the early Christians within the lifetime of St. Paul, and so they were stuck with the church. And the church had to sort things out according to its own opinions. And then it gave itself authority later on as uh, having divine inspiration to do things, which led to many Europeans seeing the corruption amongst the church. It made them disillusioned with that. And that's where the church interference with politics when they didn't have a mandate or even a law system, uh, a firm understood law system caused that issue. Whereas in every other civilization throughout the earth, there was the idea of secularism just never occurred to anybody because everyone believed that your laws come from your morals, your morals comes from your belief and your belief is your worldview. So separating your purpose in life from life's affairs was just irrational to every other civilization on the planet. It was, one could say that the issues of Christ, the, the peculiarities of Pauline Christianity, Paul's interpretation of Christianity caused later on what would become um, the problems of church authority and, and politics. Of course, that's just my opinion. Obviously, Christians are free to disagree with that. I'm not here to um, talk about Christianity. But I think uh, Fyodor Dostoevsky wrote a wonderful um, tract on this called The Inquisitor in the Brothers Karamazov. It's interesting to have a read of it. I find it quite fascinating. Um, what I would say uh, in answer to, to the uh, lady's question up there, when she said, uh, do I believe that religion is worth killing for? Oh, no, sorry, not to you, just saying religion overall. If, it, if it's worth dying for, you know, it, it is, would be very dangerous. If, is it for, if, yeah, if it's worth dying for, is it worth killing for? Well, here's the thing. 
um, religion or any political philosophy, ideology, or what have you, believes in ideas of justice. And so they it would believe that it's right to die for your concept of justice or to fight on behalf of your concept of justice. Now, John Rawls, uh, who I mentioned earlier on, um, the foremost, I would argue, the, most, the foremost political philosopher of liberalism within the last century uh, until his, his recent death, I mean, he wrote that political liberalism allows the supreme emergency exemption from, killing, uh, from the prohibition of killing civilians. So, you, so pr political liberalism allows you to kill civilians in certain exempted supreme emergencies. Uh, and he says that the statesman is a central figure in considering the conduct of war and must be prepared to wage a just war in defense of liberal democratic regimes. So uh, secular liberals believe in killing and fighting and dying for their way of life. And yet, if someone else does it for a different way of life, it's now viewed as evil. But, but unlike John Rawls, and like the Catholics, I believe that there is no exemptions from the prohibition of killing civilians. That under no circumstance, even if your civilization is going to be enslaved, under no circumstance will you uh, and, and should you uh, uh, kill innocent civilians around the world if you think it gives you victory. I think it's wrong. I think Winston Churchill is wrong. And I think that uh, anyone who justifies that is a terrorist, including um, the person I just mentioned. Right? He, he bombed... 20,000, 30,000 people under were using fire bombs, to burning them to death with fire, in Dresden. And he's lauded as the greatest Brit. What? And he argued the use of strategic bombing was to spread terror amongst the, the, the population of a, of a people. So what do you call someone who advocates bombing civilians to spread terror? Leave it to you. So that's my issue with that. So I reject that. I said modern idea. I reject that. I reject... Um, uh, uh, any uh, philosophers of political liberalism that says that liberalism allows them to do, to do that. Well, liberalism might allow them to do that, but I reject the idea. I reject and the ideology that um, uh, orders that because Islam has a blanket prohibition as well as Catholicism has a blanket prohibition under any circumstances. And here's my point. Um, what, 200 years ago, 300 years ago, John Locke well, 400 years ago, right? John Locke came up with the idea of natural rights. He believed that humans have natural rights, God-given rights, which was discernible by looking at the universe. He was refuted later on by David Hume and Jeremy Bentham, said it was nonsense on stilts, said that ought does not, um, is, does, not, does not imply ought, saying that just because you think that these are natural rights, you know, the universe doesn't believe, doesn't believe that, and they just take God out of the equation, you don't have any basis for rights except your tastes. So then what re replaced natural right theory and belief under, uh, under the will of God was utilitarianism, which in essence is, if it's convenient, then give rights. If not, then don't give rights. Your rights are there as long as it's convenient. And what did you hear regarding that, the recent CIA torture report that came out? Right? People discussed about torture. What was their arguments of to and, uh, for and against? Those who argued both for and against argued on the basis of whether it worked or not. Remember? So if, it, if I could show you that torture works, does it make it right? They say, oh, but I could save, we could save thousands of people by torturing this, this, this one or two people. Well, you know, or, or, or tens of people, or hundreds of people. Um, if, I, if that could be shown, does that make it right? If it does save other pe ten people's lives by killing one person, does that make it right? You see? So I'm saying that uh, uh, utilitarianism is rights by convenience. And what happens when it's no longer convenient to give rights to a minority? Or well, then you have Donald Trump saying, oh, we have to stop Muslims from coming into the United States until we find out what's going on. And he brings a utilitarian argument from that. And the only people that can argue against him are saying, no, it's against our constitution. And all that will happen is at some point people say, yeah, but the people who made the constitution, they're just humans. What can be made can be unmade when it's no longer convenient. And that's what I worry and that's what I fear. Whereas I believe in a, a constitution which cannot be made unmade by human convenience. Because the God of human convenience giveth, and the God of human convenience equally taketh away. And I don't believe in that God. I believe in a God that doesn't, um, uh, is not based on convenience, but rather has an objective set of morality that doesn't change and will mean that I will follow my, my principles and, uh, even if it leads me to being killed for it. Um. So, because you've run out of time, we're going to take three uh, last questions, and uh, of course you can talk to the speakers afterwards. Okay. Okay. So, okay. Can I just? All right. Yeah, sure.
Um, this is uh, an open question to all. It might be quite cynical, actually. I, I know the stage is set that it's, is humanity better off with or without religion? But do you not argue that any idea, any ideology, whether it's political, religious, social, whatever, can be hijacked by humanity and we can just find things to fight over or things to battle each other with? So, you know, that's not to say religion is good or bad, but just anything we can find things to fight over or unite over. So, uh, Rob, um, John, this might be towards you in terms of, is it the human condition just to, to find petty differences and then exaggerate them or to unite them? Uh, thank you to the speakers for the presentation. <coughs> uh, I have a question for Abdullah uh, and the Lucy. I, I was raised as a Muslim. However, uh, I need to be honest, I, I do find some uh, problems, I would say, with the teachings, troubling, I would say. Because you, you talk about not killing civilians, but we know, uh, as Mr. M. Stephen Fish in his book, Are Muslims Distinctive, uh, from his studies of Muslims uh, in mu uh, Muslim countries, he said that although, that, as you mentioned, that there are lesser cases of killings because of, of belief in, in hell, less, lesser cases of homicide because of belief in hell, there are other problems that occur, for example, the problems of persecution of LGBT community, homosexuality, problem of persecution and execution of ex-Muslims, question of women. All of these are not only by M. Stephen Fish, but it's highlighted by other Muslim families as well. So, for example, I talk about homosexuality. There is a hadith from Ibn Abbas, uh, narrated uh, from Ibn Abbas, from Muhammad, Prophet Muhammad. It says, Man wajat tumuhu ya'malu amala qawmi lut faqtilul Whoever amongst you finds anyone who does the, the, the practice of the people of Lord, kill the person who is doing it and the person whom it is being done. And you know, you have Islamic scholars and, and uh, sayings attributed to companions arguing which, are the, which is the best way to kill homosexuals. Should it be burned? Should it be burned to death? Should it be beheaded? Should it be. Should it be yeah, so my, my question is this. We have the problems of, you know, other, like, for example, man who fucked to whoever changes religion killed him. Don't you see that there is a, a problem which which uh, encourages violence? Because in, in the name of religion, attributed to Islam, and you think that it is this time for reforming the religion? Thank you. Can we have last question? Yeah, um, it's more of an observation. I'd like to know your opinion. This is for Robert. The way you speak about religion in terms of morality, humanity, these are all stuff that can come from nationalism as well, can come from culture. So the way you speak about it, would you ban nationalism and culture, make us all think and act the same way? Religion in itself, I believe, does help us. Religion has more humanity in it than a lot of traditions do in itself, a lot of cultures do, I believe. So would you ban cultures and nationalism due to that? Well, I'm not even in favour of banning religion. I think it's been tried before and it hasn't worked. I don't think there's a, I don't think it's morally right to ban something because you disagree with it. I would ban something because it's immediately dangerous. I would ban violent religious people, but I'd ban them because they're violent. I would ban violent atheists as well. Um, I wouldn't, if, if I had the power, I wouldn't ban religion because the only way to change minds, I think, is to do do so peacefully through not not through banning stuff you disagree with. So, uh, although I'm against religion, I argue against it. I'm not in favour of banning it. In fact, uh, now that the National Secular Society, for example, recently worked work, worked with the Christian Institute. We're normally kind of mortal enemies, but um, the the government's EDOs, extremism disruption orders, they they sort of said, oh, if, they they they, they were, very broad in what they classified as extremism, uh, and they they uh, they would classify someone who said that homosexuality is sinful as an extremist. And we said, well, we think, I, I I personally think I have no problem with homosexuality. I don't think it's uh, wrong, but I think people should be allowed to say that homosexuality is immoral, and I think I should be allowed to say that if if you say that, I think you're wrong, and I think you're immoral. So I'm, I'm very much in favour of freedom of speech. I'm not in favour of banning religion. I argue against it, uh, but I'm in favour of freedom of religion. Um, 
So, um, and religion, certainly religion isn't the only thing over which people fight. I'm not claiming that secularism is the answer to all problems or that atheism is the answer to all problems. But the problem with religion is that it's a sort of, it's a socially acceptable form of dogmatism. Because something comes allegedly from the mouth of God, it's thought impertinent to even question it. And this, uh, this gives it a particular danger that other forms of tribalism don't have. Oh, sorry. Yeah, um, yeah, I'm just I was going to respond to this question about your religion being hijacked by humanity or, you know, and used for, for whatever. I mean, I guess my position comes from kind of where I started, which is to see religion as a fundamentally human phenomenon in the first place. Um, and that actually one of the difficulties, in a way, one of the mis kind of mistakes of the Enlightenment is to say that you know, religion can be separated out in its pure form and treated you know, as being something else separate, separate from. Um, so, in a, so in a way, it's kind of yes and no. <laughs> it's not that there is pure religion which is hijacked. Religion is human, so therefore it lends itself to the problem of hijacking in the first place. Now, I would agree that, um, well, anything can be hijacked uh, to an extent, but there's one difference, is if a religion is based on scriptures, then whatever the humans around those scriptures do or say, the text won't change. As long as language or the understanding of the language of the original language doesn't change or they forget the original language, the text can't be changed. It's, it's in stone, so to speak. <laughs> Whereas if you are a follower of a, let's say, political philosophy such as secular liberalism like John Rawls is, the majority opinion can always be the one that will define that ideology. So it will change over time and will be whatever the people who gain sway over that say it is. Likewise, what the values of a nation is, like British values can now be defined by the Conservative Party, <laughs> scarily. And, and that's just, and, and that's it. They, they said, well, we've been voted in power, so we have this mandate uh, this unlimited mandate to define good, bad, and everything, in essence. And they always point to the fact that they've been elected to show that they have authority, for example. And who's to say otherwise? Because there's no divine book of British nationalism. I mean, the, the funny thing is, of course, is that if you, if you judge British nationalism, or rather what British values are, by um, what they say it is, then for the majority of British history, Brit Brit Britain hasn't been Britain <laughs> or following British values. Only what within the last 30, 40 years, you could say, was recognisably British in the modern sense or the, the current status quo sense of the term British. So I would say that um, scripture is, uh, has an advantage or a defence mechanism in that it's scripture. And whatever you do, you can't change what the scripture says unless you find every copy of the Quran Bible in the world and, and take a bit of Tipex and <laughs> change it and so on. You can't change what the, what the text says. Whereas um, any ideology or intellectual tradition can be redefined, changed, and so on, so on, and so forth. Um, um, I could say that it was very much European values 50 years ago to hate Jews, and before that in England to hate Catholics, for example, or to be racist. That was part of, you know, social Darwinism was very popular 18, 90 years ago. And, uh, you know, th that's changed from then, but, um, you know, things are always changing. So we have, you know, protections against torture, but, oh, there's a war on terror? Oh, now we can have exemptions from that for the, a period of time while it's useful. And then later on, we can change it. And then at later, some later point in date, we could, we could condemn it when our children can condemn it later on. Once we've done what we needed to do, quote unquote, then, then, then we, our children have the luxury of condemning it. Um, as for the question posed by... Uh, the, the gentleman over there about um, LGBT and apostates. Now, the, the thing is this, Islam doesn't discriminate against homosexuals because quite literally we don't discriminate against the word hom the homosexual. We don't have Islamic scriptures, texts, even biblical ones and even ancient Greek ones, there's no word for homosexual. There literally is no word for, for homosexual. If you just study, study um, the work of Kinsey and the Kinsey scale, it's even a, it's even a stupid c concept of heterosexual, homosexual, bisexual, because humans are more on a scale of things, right? So there are people who have slight, let's say you might call homosexual tendencies and more heterosexual tendencies, and there are some who have more homosexual tendencies but slight heterosexual tendencies. Humans more fit on a scale of sexuality, according to Kinsey, than um, just pigeonholing uh, humans into you're gay or you're bisexual, you're straight. It doesn't work. Humans don't work like that. 
basically. So as soon as you start pigeonholing people into those labels, you create the discrimination against those people. And then suddenly there's a, you have to invent gay culture and gay rights. Well, how about just rights for humans? How about just and culture changes depending on which circumstance. If you think holding hands or, or, or males kissing each other is um, an aspect of gay culture, you haven't been to the Arab world. Right? It's part of Arabic, yeah, exactly, yeah. <laughs> right? Men hold, hold each other's hands all the, you know, all the time and, and kiss, sometimes on the lips. And it's not viewed to be heteros homosexual at all whatsoever. It's platonic. Right? All right, it's, I'll get to that. So, first and foremost, um, Islam doesn't create any second class citizen of the homosexual because, as, as far as Islam is concerned, there is no heterosexual, bisexual, homosexual. There's just human beings, and human beings always have different tastes. On, on everything there is to have different tastes on. But with regards to um, uh, sexual etiquette in society, in public, the prohibition is only against um, public indecency, which also includes acts of heterosexuality in public too, as in, in physical intercourse in a public space. And it also applies to people who you, you, def you define as heterosexual as well. So it doesn't matter whether the person's homosexual, heterosexual, what have you, acts of sexual impropriety in public is what the political application of the Sharia prohibits, which, which in this country, also, you know, there's also a prohibition on sexual indecency in the public space too, by the way. But what the political Sharia doesn't get involved in is what you do in the privacy of your own home. So the political application, I say the political application of it, the theological application is obviously same-sex intercourse in Islam is a sin in the, in, the, in the Sharia, but not in the political application of the Sharia. So what you do in your own house is between you and God. All right? But what you do in your own house, between you and God, the political authorities, if they're following Sharia, have no right to ask any questions or to investigate or to do anything with regards to what you do in the privacy of your own home, even if two guys are living together. And I might add, um, two guys living together aren't prohibited from um, adopting an orphan because Islam only views it as anyone, who's, uh, as, as anyone can be qualified to adopt an orphan as long as you have money and you can look after the orphan, basically. Right? Right? Whereas only recently you gave that, you, you allowed that, but Islam doesn't even make a class of citizen called the homosexual or even you know, view it as diff different. So, um, quite literally, you know, we don't discriminate homosexuality because we don't discriminate homosexuality, full stop, from Islamic texts and sources. And the only thing that's prohibited in Islam is public uh, intercourse from, any, um, from anyone, wherever, whether it's male or male or female or female or female, male or male female, whatever. Right? You can disagree with, with the, the level of punishment, yes, you, you're, you're allowed to disagree with that, that's fine. But you can't say that Islam prosecutes homosexuals just because they're homosexual, it does not. As for the issue of apostates, and I've spoken quite uh, often about this, I believe that um, this was a, a, a Victorian uh, translate, mistranslation of uh, irtidat in the Arabic language. And I also, I also believe that Muslims themselves are also confused about th this, this term. Um, a murtad is re or, a, or the, the irtidad is really sedition and treason. So anyone who basically is causing sedition or treason in a, uh, in a state uh, is, what, is the person who is that what the crime is punished, not because they just changed their mind about religion. That's not what we're taught in schools. Well, I, I know, and that's the problem. Uh, I, I, that's the problem is what, what Muslims are being taught in schools and what uh, both by Western schools about Islam and by um, whatever schools exist in the Muslim world, uh, such as they are. But Islam doesn't actually... Uh, no one goes around saying, you know, have you changed your religion or goes around with Inquisition court to find who's, who's no longer a Muslim or not. That's not what Islam says. The Prophet Muhammad uh, even talked about this, that um, he knew who the people who had apostated were, but he didn't want to go and he didn't want to go and kill them, right? And it, so, this is the thing: is that he knew who were the, the people who had committed nifaq in Arabic. In Arabic, a munafiq, the word munafiq is more the uh, the translation of apostate, right? Whereas irtidad or murtad is more the trans, would be the translation sedition and treason. It literally translates as renegade. That's its literal translation of, of irtidad is renegade, not apostate. I would say. Um, can, can, I, can I advise you okay. to please uh, have a chat with him afterwards because we already ran out of time. Okay, all right. Um, and, and just, I suppose, just uh, finally, um, the point mentioned that, and I think you said that you wouldn't ban religion because it hasn't worked to ban it, banning religion. So if it did work, would you, uh, would you allow it? Um, is, it is it a question perhaps that needs to be raised? Um, but what I, what I would say is the Quran says something very interesting. It says, 
if God so wanted, he could have made all humanity one religion or one people. So who are you to compel people to believe? Right? So it's God's will. The Quran says it's God's will that people follow different religions. So basically, who are we to go against God's will on this matter? We can't compel people to believe. That's what the Quran says about that, that, that matter. So um, different religions don't cause division. And if you argue that, if you argue different opinions, different political opinions causes um, division, then what you're arguing is for some totalitarian uniform uh, state, whereby only people who follow the same religion or the same uh, political ideology can be tolerated. And this is what I fear is happening in uh, the West at the moment, that the belief that just because Muslims have a different uh, belief and idea, N Muslims aren't calling for the West to become Islamic or a caliphate established in the West. If you hear what Muslims are talking about, is for a, a, a just... An enlightened caliphate, like was done in, in the past, established and re-established in the Muslim world, which it was there prior to 1924, when, again, a certain <coughs> empire came and changed that, that fact. And that's when all the divisions, all the fighting, all the killing started from. Right? And if you look at history, like the Ottoman caliph, caliph was a Sunni caliph. He was looking after Shia shrines in Iraq. Shia shrines were maintained by a Sunni caliph's money. The, the Orthodox Eastern Church patriarch, the Pope of the Eastern Orthodox, Greek, Greek Eastern Orthodox Church, was uh, given a stipend by the Sunni Caliph for centuries. You know, his office was supported by, because of the right, Muslims believe in the right of people to have their own religion and their own way of life included, their own culture, whether we think it's Islamic or not, or liberal or not, or illiberal, we do not interfere. If they want to leave that religion, then they leave their society and join, let's say, if they want to become Muslim, they, they'll leave their society, that area, and join Muslim area, for example, and vice versa. That's how it works. That's how we managed true plurality. Something the West needs to learn, I think, uh, today. And, and my last point is, uh, mention, you mentioned socially accepted forms of dogmatism. Religion is viewed as that. Well, certainly not anymore. Islam is certainly um, open season on Islam and Muslims. Um, but I would say that if you just look at what the Tory party is bringing, these extremism and disruption uh, uh, orders and these extremism laws, which I, I will concede that obviously the National Secular Society and um, the Christian Institute, I believe, are opposing. Uh, but what's their arguments for why they're opposing that? Because they're worried that they might be slapped with it. Not that the, I never heard them say, Muslims have a right to political dissent. That's not in your literature, right? You just are worried that you'll, you'll be hit by it as well for, for various opinions. In some, of your, in some of the stuff that's been said in the, on the, online, I haven't seen anyone say Muslims have a right to political dissent. That's not your argument. But what I would say is that the extremism is, just, is defined as a critique of democracy, for example, or modern-day democracy. But there are so many academic and non-Muslims who are making interesting critiques of democracy. Many people are making critiques of secularism, they're calling it post-secularism now, for example. There are people who criticize secular, secular liberalism, people who criticize nationality. Nationality is predicted under hate laws, you can't criticize nationality in, uh, under, under the laws, even though nationality, one could argue, is artificial. It's an artificial construct, modern construct. So there are many socially um, uh, unacceptable uh, uh, there are many s s uh, things which are socially un unaccepted to criticise in the West beyond religion, and I would say that religion has open season uh, uh, against it to criticise it. So I would disagree with that. And well, I'm, my only point is this: Are we better off with religion? And this is the debate's topic. I think we are better off because religion provided the foundation of immutable rights. You might disagree with that religion, but everyone. Um, Everyone has had, a, has had good experience with good religions that they might like, which have given immutable rights. And that is where the issue lies. Can we live in a world with immutable rights, or, can, or should we live in a world where the rights are mutable depending on convenience? That's a question I think you should all take away. Okay. Um, I'd like to thank our, all the audience for coming to... <laughs> the debate and I'm sure lots of you are already exhausted. I, I want to believe okay. You Don't want to say something? Reflection on the debate. That's yeah. All. yeah, it's okay. Your um reflection on the issues raised Dr. Johnson. Okay. You're just like a <laughs> is, is there any pizza left? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think it's been an interesting debate obviously um, not entirely 
unpredictable in terms of the way in which it's, it, it's kind of panned out. You know, when we oppose these things, you know, we have a, a, a scholar of and within religion advocating that we wouldn't be better off without it. Sorry, I'm trying to, my, my double negatives are getting, <laughs> we wouldn't be better off without well, it. I, I wouldn't say I was a scholar, I'm just <laughs> advocate. Mm-hmm. Scholarly, perhaps. Um, uh, and a secularist, obviously, you know, with the position that you uh, would, be, would be better off. I mean, I think what, what, what it reveals, you know, for me, is you know, certain principles about you know, the ways in which we think about and look, about, look at religion. Which are these questions of the, you know, the problems of generalization, the necessity to particularize, the necessity to historicize, uh, and the necessity to think carefully and sensitively about the relationships between um, forms of, kind of theology, religious theory, if you like, and the actual practices of, of, of those you know, in, in the real world. Um, as an anthropologist, I'm always interested in that question of you know, how things, these things happen kind of in the real world. Um, and that's kind of what what we try to do to un, you know to understand to understand you know for, for the kind of uh, the betterment of dialogue for the betterment of understanding and to you know to allow an understanding and to a certain extent an advocacy of of difference because we are a species we are a species I set up by saying we are a species for whom. Uh, religion is kind of a central central part. We're also a species for whom difference is a fundamental part as well. Thank you very much. Um, well, a few comments. You, you mentioned you said religion is a human quality. I, I think it's. Uh, I have to explain it somehow. It, religion certainly exists. Um, and I, I think I think religion is a byproduct of some very human qualities, a, a capacity to see agency, a desire to avoid death. So uh, I don't think religion is going to go away anytime soon, and that's one reason I think banning it's a stupid idea. Um, so um, I, but I, I don't, as I say, I don't think it's a human quality. I think it's an outcome of human qualities, a product of human qualities. So slight difference between us there, or maybe you agree with me. I don't know. Um, yeah, now, you know, you said that, that it's God's will that there be lots of different religions. How do you reconcile that with the idea that it's God's will that we worship Him, given that Christians don't worship the same God as you, given that Buddhists don't worship any God at all? How do you reconcile those two uh, claims you made about Islam? I think you're trying to be all things to all men. Um, you said in secularist literature there's no rights to Muslims having a, a, a right to political dissent. Well, secularism doesn't spell out Muslims do this, Christians do this explicitly, but uh, inherent in the idea of secularism is one law for all. You don't need to spell out what happens for Muslims and what happens for Christians. You just lay down one rule for everyone. Let's not have religious exceptions all over the place. Uh, it's, it's difficult enough to agree on a law anyway. Uh, you only have to look at what divides us when we don't take religion into account on all kinds of things like planning regulations or you know who should fund what and how much borrowing there should be. Um, these aren't religious questions, they're very divisive. And what makes things worse is if you bring in different rules for different religions. All secularism asks is that we don't make exceptions for religions, that Muslims have the same rights, no more and no less, than anybody else. Can you respond in like a minute? Yeah, okay. <laughs> it's asking awesome question, so I'll be... All right. Um, uh, no one's really asking for uh, uh, Muslim exceptionality on anything. Um, I was merely pointing to the fact that the National Secular Society and the Christian Institute, in opposing the um, upcoming extremism laws, have not cited um, uh, it, the reason for their opposition being that Muslims deserve to have the right to difference of opinion, but rather they, were, they cited that they were only worried that it would affect both the secular critiques of, uh, of uh, different religious traditions being viewed as extremist and um, Christianity, cr- Christians' critique of, or, or belief in certain things as being viewed as an extremist. If you do have any literature that, that mentions that uh, this law should be opposed because Muslims will be marginalized and will be um, denied the right to political dissent, 
please produce it, but I've been analysing all that literature very closely and that hasn't been mentioned. And so that was my issue, that it seems that the rights of minorities aren't protected, only just kind of saving your worry that you'll be about it would be affecting your own skin in that matter. That's why I mentioned it. I didn't say that does sec secularism somewhere in some scroll somewhere that say that Muslims need to have rights. I didn't say that. I said about in that particular, your current campaign, you don't, you don't really care about the fact that this, this, this uh, legislation, which has been targeted towards Muslims very specifically, uh, will be de denying us our rights uh, in the matter. Um, as for the issue of, you know, is it God's will to have different religions? Um, how does it answer the fact that Christians worship a different God? They don't worship a different God. Um, the, the God, the, the, the Father, is the same God that we worship. Um, we, but we have different theories about God's will, and we have different theories about how he manifested it, that will to mankind, just like you have different theories about gravity or, different, or before different theories about the sun. It doesn't mean that God doesn't exist. It doesn't mean that the sun doesn't exist or gravity doesn't exist or that there is no one correct understanding. It just means that humans are divided on these different matters and that's why we have different religions. And we believe as Muslims that the purpose of mankind is to choose uh, to follow the truth uh, under no compulsion, which is why there should be plurality of um, religions because human will having the right to have free will in this matter, believes that that's the case. But if you don't believe in spirituality or the soul, the, I think the greater question posed by Sam Harris, your uh, fellow atheist, is, is that the, if humans don't have free will, then what right of freedom do they really have? If you're, we're just mechanistic on automatons, then what argument can you put forward to say that you, have, you should have the right to have free will when there is no such thing as free will or the soul, which, which facilitates that? Something that religion doesn't have a problem with, but I think materialism uh, does and has to answer. Thank you very much. I guess this is it. So, <laughs> um, I want to thank you all for coming, especially the speakers, for taking their time to talk to us about lots of things that we have no idea about. Uh, I want to believe that they have discussed so many different things that we will go back home probably to sit down and think about. It has been such a fantastic intellectual discourse. I want to thank you all, and uh, I would encourage you to like us on Facebook because this is just the debut uh, for a series called The Till Line. We have lots of other activities in January, February, March, up to the end of the year. Thank you very much for honoring this invitation. Thank you.